keep okay. monitoring it. Okay. So good morning, everyone. Good Monday morning. Thanks for joining us. Um, I'm Kelly Sather. I'm the training coordinator for the uh, Montana Public Defender's Office. And I'm really excited about today's training. Um, this started with Brian Smith asking me to do a treatment court training, but I knew there had just been a state treatment court training. And I thought, well, what are we going to do that people just didn't go to, that people had just been at? But I'm not sure that many people got to attend the state uh, treatment court training. And I started looking into it and saw that what we really needed was treatment court training for defense attorneys and specifically for defense attorneys and our role in treatment courts. And so um, I finally got a hold of Jeff Kushner, reached out to him, and he set this whole thing up. Um, Marie Lane has been amazing, and we've got some great speakers. I'm just going to introduce. Um, our speakers briefly before we get started. Carolyn Hardin's going to start at 8.15. Um, a few uh, things to take care of first. Please keep yourself muted um, while uh, during the training. And please show your faces if you can. It's sometimes nice for speakers to have all your bright, shiny faces showing, especially on a Monday morning. So don't be afraid to show your face. And um, so the first speaker is Carolyn Hardin, and she's the Chief of Training and Research for the National Association of Drug, Drug Court Professionals, um, which is a non-governmental organization based in Washington, DC. She oversees the daily operations for NADCP's three divisions. There's the National Drug Court Institute, the National Center for DWI Courts, and the Justice for Vets. And um, she is going to talk about the latest treatment court research, emphasizing both what practices have been proven to reduce drug use and recidivism, along with practices that practitioners and programs should avoid, which I think is gonna be very um, useful for some of us in some of our treatment courts around the state. Um, next, I wanna introduce Marie Lane. She's a project director with the Justice for Vets division of the NADCP. And um, she's been a career public defender. So we can all relate to Marie. <laughs> and um, she was an assistant public defender and then director of the Ashtabula County Public Defender's Office. Um, that's in Ohio. And she's um, served on a lot of commissions on specialized dockets, um, has done a lot with treatment courts. Um, she's also been on her uh, the defense attorney on her county's family drug court treatment team um, and on the advisory committee of the adult, adult felony mental health court. So um, she brings a lot of experience and I think it's gonna be very helpful for us defense attorneys in treatment courts. Um, she's going to speak on the role of the defense attorney, um, the why, what, and how of serving as a defense attorney in treatment courts. And she's also going to talk about constitutional and legal issues in treatment courts. So um, hopefully those of you that are coming in and out, I hope you can make um, Marie's, especially as a defense attorney in treatment courts. Um, we also have Ann Dannerbeck Janku. Um, she has a very interesting um, start. She was an agricultural economist working with family systems in the countries of West Africa, but she became very involved in research and enhancing practice in drug courts for much of her career. Um, she's been particularly active in developing strategies to enhance equity and inclusion in drug courts. She developed a toolkit to enhance equity in adult drug courts and is currently developing a toolkit to enhance equity in juvenile treatment courts. And she is going to speak on the role of defense attorneys in enhancing access and inclusion in drug treatment courts. And I think that's something we don't all think about a lot. I know we come into it in our practice of why does this one person get in 
to this treatment court program and your other client can't get in. And I think that's going to be a very important um, session also, how um, we can help our client, the clients that need need and should be in treatment court and get them in there. Um, and then we have Jeffrey Kushner. And again, I mentioned Jeffrey, he was basically got this all set up for me. And um, he's the Montana statewide drug court coordinator with the Montana Supreme Court in the office of the court administrator. He's a strong advocate for implementation of evidence-based practices within treatment port court programs and drug courts. And he's developed several instruments and published numerous documents in the treatment in the treatment and treatment court field. Um, and Jeffrey's just going to do give us a little bit about Montana Drug Court Teleservices Initiative and what that's all about this afternoon. He'll do that. So, um, some I'm going to monitor the chat. And so please feel free to ask questions. Um, oh, I forgot Fred. Fred Stodgrass, the, the ethics speaker. Um, Fred graduated from the University of Montana School of Law in 2001, and he was with the Yellowstone County Attorney's Office as a prosecutor for almost three years. But then he transitioned into private practice in 2004. He's focused on criminal defense, family law, and personal injury cases. And um, he's worked with treatment courts in Montana since 2006 and has presented on treatment courts nationally. Um, and he's also on the faculty of the National Center for DWI Courts. Um, so Fred is going to... Um, speak on professionalism and ethics presenter. And I, um, some of you did present questions to us, um, to me that I sent on to Fred. And so he's gonna talk about the statutes and the ethical rules and the interplay between the two of them for defense attorneys and treatment courts. And um, hopefully he can answer all the questions that have come up about the ethics of the defense role in treatment courts. So um, again, I'm going to monitor the chat. Um, I'm going to start with Carolyn, and I'll let Carolyn do a little more introduction for herself if she'd like. And then Carolyn, if you want to let us know if you want questions to be brought up to you as they come in, or if you want to wait till the end of your presentation. Good morning. You can interrupt and give me the questions as we go along. OK. OK. Well, Carolyn, thank you for being here. I um, This is, I think, a very important part of um, the knowledge about treatment courts to learn how what the latest research is. And so looking forward to hearing from you and go ahead and um, we'll start. Well, good morning, everyone. As they said, my name is Carolyn Harden. I'm the Chief of Training and Research with the National Association of Drug Corps Professionals. I am delighted to be here with you this morning. Uh, just so you guys know, I am in the midst of my audit. So I was like, well, I am going to step away, do my presentation, and then go back. So please ask any questions that you may have as we move forward. This presentation that I'm going to share with you is a presentation uh, that we do at our different discipline-specific uh, trainings. This presentation was developed by Dr. Doug Marlowe, who is our senior scientific consultant. So I'm going to get right into it, I think. So we call this drug court, and what about drug courts that work? And so I want to share with you some of the things that we know. So one thing that has come up that's always been an issue uh, that we have to talk about in treatment courts is really what the problem is. And one thing that we all can probably agree to is that about 80% of the crime in the, uh, that happens in the country uh, 80% of the justice involved persons have, the research shows that they have illicit drug use 
or alcohol use as a part of their uh, case when they come in. This is probably not new to you guys as defense attorneys who are working with your clients. This is something you probably see. We also know that 50% have a diagnosed substance use disorder. So it's not just that they're using, but about 50%. The other data that come in is that 60% of arrestees for violent property, financial crimes, test positive for illicit drugs at arrest. And this data is coming from the Bureau of Justice Assistance uh, from what they collect in their data of arrest data from the, from the jails that actually uh, do uh, drug testing. And then one of the thing is this, that it shows that there's continued substance use increases recidivism by 200 to 300%. And that is, if we just put people in prison, half of them are rearrested within the first year, two thirds are rearrested within three years, and 80% are rearrested within nine years. And this is just as we put them in uh, prison without doing anything else. This is what the data shows us. So let's talk about adult drug courts. One of the reasons that treatment courts were designed was to serve as an alternative to incarceration for jail and prison. And so there have been now a number of meta-analyses that have been done and studies that say, you know, drug courts have an impact. They actually do work and they work for certain people. And so one of the things that has been done and uh, I, you guys don't have this sli my slides, I definitely will send them to you. So make sure that you have a copy of the slides. But these are the different studies. If you look at it, just talks about a meta-analysis means that we looked at all the different types of studies. And then there were some that were multi-study sites. So that meant that they went to different treatment courts and they looked at those different courts. Uh, so one of the things in here also is a systemic, um, a systematic review, which is done by the Government Accounting Office, uh, which they often do to look at is the systems over time, over the way that they operate, how does that look? And so one of the things that we can tell you is that if you look at the uh, third column, it's the number of drug courts that were included in the study. And we can tell you that drug courts reduced crime anywhere between 18 to 14%. And that in some places they have had a greater reduction of crime, as you can see in the multi-site study that looked at 69 courts. That study was, uh, re was redone again in, I think, 2014, where we looked at 169 courts and was able to see a continuation of the crime reduction uh, in those areas. So we know that they have an impact on reducing crime. And so one of the things that we know by that is that these are the courts that actually follow what is called the 10 key components or the best practices, especially in the adult drug court model. So I wanna talk you through some of the data that was shown through the various studies that had impact uh, of how they were able to look and see. So one looks at, there was a test done on drug testing, looked in that saliva test at 18 months post uh, completion of treatment court. There was a comparison group. These people got similar things, but did not go through the drug court model. And as you can see with any drug, the reduction uh, for treatment co courts was lower than that for uh, the comparison group. And any serious drugs, you continue to see that for marijuana, for cocaine. And I think it's important to see for opiates, it was a slight uh, reduction, but uh, still about six to 7% for those who, 6% for those who completed uh, treatment courts. And so when you look at that, we saw that over time, after even completing drug courts, uh, that they had a longer gain of sustained recovery and use uh, even 18 months after completing what? So one of the things that we do know that the research tells us is that when we look at the best practices, that the responsibility of the treatment court judge 
every study that has been done has come back that shows that the judge has a powerful impact in this process. And so here are some of the things that we know that causes that positive impact. For example, if the judge spends an average of three minutes or more per participant during the status review hearing, you get a 36% cough savings and you get a 153% greater reduction in recidivism. So let me explain what this means by cost savings. This is criminal justice costs. It's not societal costs. It's just criminal justice costs. So there's a cost every time the prosecutor enters the room for the defense attorney to enter a room, for the police to arrest someone, uh, for there to be housed. So those are types of things we're talking about when we talk about criminal justice costs. And then a reduction in recidivism. One of the things that came out was that with the length of the interaction, the outcomes were significantly better. Uh, as much as seven minutes interacting with the participants. Shorter interactions, uh, here's the deal, may not allow the judge sufficient time to gauge each participant's performance in the program and intervene on the participant's behalf and, a, and even to impress upon the participant the importance of compliance with treatment or to communicate to the participants their efforts that are recognized and valued by staff. So just by having them show up and say, you've done well, that doesn't help, but really have an engaging conversation with them, that was impactful and had long-term uh, benefits. The other show, study showed that when the judge was assigned to the treatment court on a voluntary basis, had better outcomes as well as the length of time. So one of the things that the study showed there was that there was a study done in Oregon, and it was a 14-year study of that drug court. And what they did in Oregon uh, is that they would rotate their judges every two years, and every two years they would have a dip in the success of those programs. And their recidivism would show that impact. Because when you come into this treatment court model, <clears throat> everybody trying to learn their job, there's like a two year turnaround. So, right, you just learn, you get in, you learn the job. By the second year, you kind of figure out what you're doing and then they will move you out. And then that process will start all over again with a new person coming in that had a significant impact on the participants and long-term on the recidivism rate of that program. And so then it was recommended that your treatment court judges should be there at least two consecutive years, but longer is better but to have that. And then you don't wanna just put someone into that role to be the judge, because again, every study shows that the participants see the judge oftentimes as that father figure, that mother figure, somebody giving them encouragement, somebody also holding them accountable consistently that has that impact. So having somebody who really wants to be in that role, because you, you guys know this better than anyone, folks can pick up on when people don't want to be there or don't have empathy for them. So having someone who really wants to be in that role has impact. So this is uh, one of the studies. Now let's talk about everybody else being on the team. When everybody shows up and participates in staffing, so that's the judge, the prosecutor, defense, the treatment, the probation, the court coordinator, your core team members show there's a 20% uh, uh, cost savings, but there's a 50% reduction in recidivism when all the players are there. Then, Defense attorney, you guys get your own kind of uh, staff uh, slide because it showed a 93% greater cost savings when the uh, defense attorney attends uh, staffing, as well as there's another study that came out in uh, 2019 when we looked at the equity and inclusion lens of this data. So we took that read practice data and said, what does this mean when you look at it uh, as it relates to disparate income impacts in treatment courts? If the defense attorney attended staffing and the treatment court session, 
there was a reduction in disparate impact in those courts that actually had a defense attorney in the staffing and in the court. And when they did some of the interviews with participants about that, it was, there was, they felt like there was somebody in there who was advocating on their behalf. When treatment attends staffing, you get a greater reduction in recidivism, about 105%. And so this is in comparison to those courts where those folks don't attend. And one is because now you have someone really speaking to what the issues are, talking about the clinical impact that has an impact on how that team should respond. Uh, one of the other ones is law enforcement. When a law enforcement attends staffing, it's a 67% greater reduction in recidivism. Now, I have a, a background in doing research, but years ago, I used to be a probation officer. And I remember when this study uh, came out, I was like, well, what about probation? There was no uh, significant impact with probation. And one of the reasons was because they uh, we hypothesized that Law enforcement really is seen as the heavy arm of the law, as well probation oftentimes may be seen as case management and doing those things. But it had a greater reduction and also uh, some of the studies show changed a perspective from the participants of the law enforcement that were participating on their team. When the coordinator attends, you get a 58% greater reduction in recidivism and a 41% in cost savings. So what about the hearings? That's the staffing. Again, you see a 35% greater reduction when all the team members are there and a 36% cost savings. Here's the other thing. When people first come into our programs, especially if we're talking about serving that high risk, high need population, it says that they should have status review hearings at least every two weeks in the first phases when they come into the program. Now this is significant because there was a study done uh, in a program out in California. And one of the things the study was, it was a, a, a true kind of like randomized control study. Some people uh, came to court every two weeks, some courts, some people came only when uh, they were asked to come. The outcomes were so bad for the individuals where it was, they weren't coming to see them every two weeks that they had to stop the study because it was determined that they were doing harm. So we know that when you're working with that high risk, high need population, that we should at least see them every two weeks in the early phase. That treatment attends court. Not only should they be in the staffing, but they should be in the courtroom uh, with everybody else as we're going through the process in the hearings. Look at the reduction in recidivism. And even when law enforcement attends court, there's an 83% reduction when they participate and sit in in the hearings. So we know that these are things that programs should be doing because they have a greater reduction on recidivism as well as an impact on savings. So let's talk about who should be in the program. One of the things that the research shows is that when treatment courts exclude referrals with uh, serious mental health issues, you know, this is something that courts have to look at. Oftentimes when drug courts initially started, they were like, well, we're not gonna take people who have mental health issues. And I would sit back and go, well, you're not gonna know that for a while for some folks, because what we know is that some drug use, uh, some drugs can mimic uh, some of the uh, things that cause some of the mental health symptoms. So and when people come in, we have to not get caught up into which came first, the chicken or the egg, the substance use or the mental health. We have to try to treat those individuals when they come in meeting whatever the needs are. And so we know that addressing folks, getting them the services that they need can also help uh, impact recidivism. Now, some of you all may be in jurisdictions that have both a mental health court and a, an adult or a drug court. Then what has to happen is and assessments to figure out uh, which court would better suit those individuals. Some folks with very severe mental health, if there is a mental health court, they may do better in the mental health court. But if they're stabilized, taking their meds, they may do just as well in the treatment court. 
So that's something that you all have to look at with uh, your clinical professionals. Uh, one other thing that we know that the sooner we can get people engaged in treatment, the better the outcomes. So the research says program entry is 50 days or less. What I will tell you is don't get caught up in the number of days. You want to make sure that you're doing it better than the status quo, because sometimes there's a fine line between research and reality where your reality says we can't do this greater than 50 days. But what the question has to be, are you doing it better than the status quo? If it takes people nine months to generally get the treatment, but your treatment court is doing it in 100 days or 80, 90 days, that's better than the status quo. Well, because you're bringing all the folks together, all the players, hopefully you can navigate some of those things that are hindrances to be able to get people in. But you can't just think, we don't want people to trample over folks due process rights. So we want to figure out which is the best way we can do it to have the greatest impact. The research is clear, high risk, high need people. So when we talk about high risk, we're talking about people who have criminal behavior. They need accountability. When we're talking about high needs, these are folks who cannot stop using drugs and alcohol that have a substance use disorder. They have been, they have a diagnosis around moderate to severe. That means that they have persistent uh, issues. They have withdrawals. They can't just stop using because you tell them to stop using. So we're looking at people who have criminal behavior and substance use uh, issues. That's our treatment court population. And so those are the folks. And the research says 50% greater reduction. So what we want to keep this in mind, and if you take low risk folks, these are folks who don't have a lot of criminal behavior, who can uh, oftentimes putting them in jail will scare them. We do not want to engage those folks with our high risk folks because we can make those low risk individuals worse. We can give them too much exposure to the criminal justice system. And so that's why treatment courts need to do risk assessments and clinical assessments to actually identify, does this person truly meet high risk so that we don't do the wrong thing to them? Uh, we do the right things in providing them with services. We also want to look at that years ago, many treatment courts, when they first started, were pretrial programs. They were diversion programs. You came in and they were, a lot of them were looking at drug cases, like possession cases and all of that. But we want to know that when you're looking at those high risk, high need offenders, they don't always just have drugs. You want to look at non-drug charges. These may be drug-driven cases. Sometimes that we're looking at uh, property cases, theft cases, really to try to get those individuals into our program. Uh, they do extremely well in treatment court. Uh, and then when we look at your caseloads, one of the things uh, that people have to keep in mind is that if it takes a lot to do it with, 30 to 40 people, when you start expanding, then you need to make sure that your services expand. So if you one of the research studies says probation should be 30 to one caseload. Well, if you go to 125 and you only got two probation officers, your program is going to lack. So you would have to increase your probation officer. You would have to increase your treatment. You need to make sure that when you get ready to increase your caseload, that you increase your staffing and services so that you don't have a reduction in recidivism. So we don't want you to stay at 10 and 15. If you can serve more, just recognize you have to increase everything else to continue to meet the needs of the population. So let's talk about treatment. Gender specific services, no matter where you go, whether it's drug court or anywhere, the research in the clinical world says that you have better outcomes when you offer gender specific services. Now, it, oftentimes in some of our rural jurisdictions, that's not uh, uh, feasible when they're doing groups to have one that's for male and one for females. What we often recommend for those communities is then you wanna offer 
uh, have your providers offer more individual sessions because it may be very difficult for a woman or a man to be in a group setting to really talk about the issues of what happened to them or what's going on with them, especially when one of, some of the people in that room represent some of their past traumas. So it's something that uh, programs have to look at. They have guidelines and on the frequency of individual treatment sessions. So here's what we're talking about. Pro treatment programs that use evidence-based modalities, meaning manualized treatment. The providers have been trained in some treatment program. Uh, they go to classes, they learn, so they know that I'm giving this uh, module this day, I'm supposed to have these outcomes. They have a tool that says, these people should get this many sessions, it should be this many hours. When they do that and follow those manualized treatment, you have a greater reduction in recidivism. They're called cognitive behavior therapies, and they work better for folks who have criminal behavior as well as high, moderate to severe substance use needs. They have better outcomes. Also, when treatment communicates with the court via email, if somebody doesn't show up, you want them to not wait a week or two to tell, but to let somebody know because a client could be in crisis. This is an opportunity for us to intervene to figure out what's going on as opposed to putting people away to jail or letting it get bad, if we can intervene very early, that's an opportunity to really meet the needs of that client and to be more therapeutic and less punitive. And also if they offer mental health treatment. We have lots of folks who come in who are struggling with other issues. If we can do assessments to figure out what's going on, especially when we know that folks who have chronic alcoholism generally suffer from depression, we want to address that. We also need to know that 50, studies have shown that 50 to 75 percent of the women who come in the criminal justice system have had some kind of violence or traumatic experience that happened at the hand of a caregiver or someone who was supposed to uh, be taking care of them at an early age. So they may be suffering from some issues that if we can do some assessments early on to address that, to really get them the services that they need. So let's talk about drug testing. One thing that uh, I wish that many people would stop thinking is that drug testing is out to get you. Uh, drug testing oftentimes can be used as a tool to support the clients in their recovery journey. And so one of the things that the study says that drug test results, getting them back within two days or less has better outcomes and lower recidivism. Why? Because if you then, if it takes three and two weeks to get it done, then you might be trying to hold people accountable, but all these other things have happened that are positive and then folks are only want to focus on that one negative, but the clients have done all these other things. So the research tells us, especially behavior modification, the sooner that we can address a behavior, the better the outcome. And especially if we can figure out what's going on, why are they using, what is happening, there might be other factors that we need to be in bringing in. Could be housing issues, loss, grief, that we wanna make sure that's being addressed. And in the first phases, early coming into the program, drug tests are collected at least two times per week. And what this means is that as clients, as we, as clients progress through the program, we should then be able to drop off drug testing, but only when we start dropping back other requirements, other activities, should we look into reducing drug testing. And the research says that when participants have greater than 90 days of sobriety time uh, before they commence, they have better outcomes. And really what we wanna make sure is that they have stability, that they are in their recovery journey, working a program, that they have that, they have better outcomes long-term when they are no longer in our program. Let's talk about sanctions and incentives. Sanctions are imposed immediately after non-compliant behavior. 
So we need to know what's going on and to address it. When we don't address things, there's this thing called learned helplessness. So our clients may have been able to get away with some behaviors or continue to do it when we don't address it. But each team should have some guidelines for their sanctions as well as their incentives. One thing that happen is that courts are really good at focusing on the sanctioning, but not so good at focus, focusing on incentives. And the research tells us that when we actually address and recognize positive behavior, we also have better outcomes. So making sure that the team is collecting what incentives did we give, what sanctions did we give, when did we give them, what was the impact, and what are our guidelines? Uh, recognizing that there's this thing called proximal, what folks can do right away, and distal, things that people won't be able to do until down the line, that courts should be looking at that and saying, if they're in our first phase of our program, what's proximal? What's a proximal behavior? What's a distal behavior? And actually putting that into your guidelines so that you're understanding who your clients are and how you're going to respond. So one thing I wanna say is this, Treatment courts love to use jail. The research says that jail does have some impact, but overuse of jail has a negative impact. You should not be putting people into jail for longer than six days because after six days, the impact of that drops. What the research, research tells us is that short bouts of incarceration have better outcomes. And what we really wanna do is figure out what is the behavior and how we're going to respond to the behavior. So we're not saying that you shouldn't use jail, but we're saying you should use jail sparingly because if that is your highest magnitude sanction that you got and you use it coming out the gate, you have nowhere else to go. And there are many other things that can have impact to meet the needs of our clients to help them modify behavior. Because that is the one thing that we're really trying to do is to modify behavior. So you'll see here, this just shows you the decrease uh, in it. And then at, at six days, the, the impact starts to lessen. So some promising practices that are related to positive outcomes in drug courts. The staff should participate in training, uh, prior to uh, implementing a program, the judge should receive formal training and all team members receive training ongoing as well. But if uh, pre-training has better outcomes. So what do we know about DWI courts? Here's what the research says. With DWI courts, there was a meta-analysis study on 28 evaluations done in 2012. And DWI courts reviews both DWI recidivism, meaning impaired driving, and general criminal recidivism by an average of more than 12%. And then look at this, DWI courts reduce recidivism by as much as 50 to 60%. So that is significant uh, that we see an impact with DWI courts. And here's what you can look at. When you look at DUI recidivism against uh, the base rate, which is those in the uh, non-DUI. So you see here 37% uh, for the drug court and then for general recidivism with the regular population about 38%. So you see those folks who go through the DUI uh, treatment courts have greater uh, reduction in recidivism. Let's talk about family dependency treatment courts. So one of the things about family dependency treatment courts that the research shows, and this was a meta-analysis of 17 studies, and this study is relatively new in 2019. And here's what it showed, twice the average likelihood of family reunification. So when folks go through these courts, greater re uh, likelihood of, of re uh, family reunification reunification, likelihood of new child maltreatment report or re-entry to foster care system uh, is likely due to low statistical power. This was uh, half the likelihood of that happening. The effects lasted at least two years 
even post-program completion. And the largest effects for the better studies were compared, had comparison samples. So in the research world, when there's a comparison group versus who's going through, you get better, uh, it's a better study because you're looking at apples and apples to see what is happening. And so this is what they were able to do. Three times the odds of caregivers entering uh, substance use treatment. So that meant that the folks who, the kids were removed from, the family members, the caregivers, uh, mothers, fathers, whoever, were actually getting treatment and having uh, better outcomes. Uh, they were also not only getting treatment, but completing that treatment and the twice the odds of child reunification. So it significantly increased and fewer days to reunification, meaning where in some in the comparison group, it took a longer time for uh, for them to get their kids back, but it didn't in the family dependency treatment court model. So here's the one thing, who's their target population? It's the same high risk, high need. Uh, one of the things that they saw that guardians had, had who had co-occurring mental health problems had better, had did well in these programs, even when they were unemployed, working with them helped to get them employed. A number of the guardians had less than high school uh, education. They had criminal records. They had inadequate housing and they were at risk for domestic violence. So these were some of the things that they saw with that high risk population uh, in the family dependency treatment courts. Here's what we saw, the best practices, weekly counseling sessions in phase one, at least 15 months of treatment, positive judicial and counselor attributes where they were engaging, developing those relationships, uh, had better outcomes, frequent drug and alcohol testing. This oftentimes come up uh, in this model that some people uh, don't do drug testing, but the ones who had the greater reduction uh, in recidivism and better outcomes did drug and alcohol testing. Home-based outreach, actually sending someone in the home to work with them. So not just having counseling sessions where they came in, but doing things in the home supporting the, uh, the parent or the caregiver in the home with the child, doing observation and giving them feedback, and teaching the guardians effective parenting skills, monitoring and disciplinary skills. Different ways to discipline, not judgmental, but showing them some new techniques that they may be able to use uh, when working with uh, their, uh, their child. So let's talk about juvenile drug courts. So we are pleased to say that the initial studies that were out in juvenile drug court were not that positive. The early studies in 2012 said that basically there was no uh, effect from someone going through ju juvenile drug court or the regular criminal justice system. And so when we begin to look at that data, a new study has come out and essentially, when this was done, what the kind of said was, don't throw the baby out with the bathwater. And since what was happening was that those juvenile drug courts were not following the key components for juvenile drug courts. So over the past uh, couple of years, there have been uh, what's called juvenile guidelines, like the standards have been developed. And there is a new study. The research for that is soon to be released. Uh, but I have seen the preliminary outcomes and those programs that follow the standards and the guidelines, uh, the guidelines and the uh, juvenile uh, key components have had better outcomes. And I don't know why my slide says at the top family drug court data. This is truly juvenile drug court data. And so before I send that to you, I will fix that. There uh, was a uh, small to no effects when you look at it uh, of that data. So here's what we now know uh, is that there was 44% needed improvement. There were about 22% of them that were really effective. And again, uh, 
let it shows that there were 77% of the deficient programs. So as a result of that, some states end up closing their programs and the newer uh, courts that are coming on are following the new guidelines. And again, that study is still, uh, the, the data is being written up on the new study. But here's where the hope is that is coming. Ju uh, juvenile treatment courts that were trained on best practice guidelines compared to randomized or matched samples of the traditional juvenile drug courts, here's what we now saw, 28 percentage point reduction in rearrest rates. We also are beginning to see a 17 percentage point reduction in cannabis use among those juveniles. So there was low usage in the most groups on uh, other illicit drugs, but a 30% point increase in receipt of needed mental health services. And this is important because one of the studies shown that with uh, juveniles, mental health issues kind of escalated during COVID. And so one of the things that is showing that those kids that are coming through the program had a high significant mental health, but they are also getting the services that they needed in the juvenile uh, treatment courts. So uh, some uh, no effect on the self-reported mental health problems, but those that had documented are getting uh, the assistance that they need. So let's look at mental health courts. There have been two large studies on mental health courts, one in 2011 and one in 2017. And what we can tell you is that uh, the data is showing that with mental health courts and the comparisons, that mental health courts have a greater reduction in recidivism. And if you can look at the 2017 uh, study, uh, a 10% versus 27% uh, percent with the comparison group that we're seeing that mental health courts actually do reduce recidivism. And this just kind of breaks down some of the different studies that came uh, that was uh, small to moderate odds of a new conviction, a number of new convictions were down. Uh, the number of days that we saw that they spent in jail was lower uh, uh, due to participants participating in the mental health courts. Also, the number of new arrests were lower for those folks who participated in mental health courts. So what do we learn? We know that adult drug courts work for adult, for high risk, high need population, following the key, key and key components and the best practices. We know that family drug courts, DUI courts and mental health courts work. Uh, we know that many juvenile courts are not following the model and produce some ineffective outcomes. However, if they adhere to best practices, they can produce highly positive uh, results for that population. The same lessons from adult drug courts concerning target population and best practices appear to apply to other treatment courts as well. But we need more research to identify the other best practices for these programs. The jury is still out on the other types of treatment courts. For example, we don't have any uh, great research yet on our veteran treatment courts. They seem to be promising with a few of the studies but there is a application out. They haven't awarded it yet, uh, but uh, this year or at the start of next year, we'll begin a national study on veteran treatment courts. So uh, that is one that we look forward to seeing that data come out in the next two years. Any questions? you have any questions, if you want to put it in the chat or raise your hand, we can unmute you. I see one question in the chat. How do you count for the possibility of selection, of self-selection, wherein those who are willing to enter treatment court are already predisposed, predisposed to lower their drug use? That must have come to you, Carolyn. I didn't see that one. Sorry. Oh, yeah, I'm sorry. Carolyn, can you repeat that question? 
How do you account for the possibility of self-selection wherein those who are willing to enter treatment court are already predisposed to lower their drug use? So I'm not sure how to answer that. So I'll answer it with some more data. How about that? Uh, one of the things that we know is that the studies have shown that even when people uh, don't really want to enter treatment court, so they get an option between door number one and door number two. Door number one is three years. Door number two is this 18 to 24 month treatment court. I'll take that. Uh, that essentially those folks don't really come to treatment court because they want to. It was a better option. Right. So the research shows that those individuals do just as well. And so they like to call it coerced treatment. I like to call that uh, external motivation for treatment. And so that they come in and that essentially a number of the issues that folks are dealing with that they have never had an opportunity to address the treatment, the counseling, and some of the services. Like, especially when drug courts have good wraparound services for housing. Uh, for employment services, that is not this program isn't just addressing one of my needs, but wrapping around to address a lot of my needs that may help, may address some of the use and other issues that I have. And so it's really talking to one of the things I've identified and the research shows, Dr. Ann Young, who you're going to hear from later, one of the studies that she did showed that when you educate participants about what the benefits of treatment courts are, more folks are apt to come in. But courts, the first thing that we tell clients about is what they can't do. Not that there is an opportunity for um, opportunity for treatment, but not just treatment, but we might help you with housing. You need a job. There's going to be employment services. Somebody's going to help you do a resume. Uh, you need to learn how to come, do a meal. Many programs have nutrition programs or programs to help you to address some of your anxiety. We don't talk about the benefits of the program. We only start with, you gotta be drug tested. You can't go here, you can't go that. So when you hear all that, you're like, okay, this program not so helpful. What's the difference of it between everything else? And we have to do a better job of teaching our courts to talk about the benefits. Think about it. When you got your job, many of us were like, oh, so y'all, there's a 401k, there's a retirement plan. Some of that was the benefits of taking that job as opposed to some of our workload. And that keeps us coming back. So we have to do that engagement and motivation for folks. The next question I have is I noticed that the data and results are from before COVID. What data have you regarding the possible impact of COVID on having fewer face-to-face -face meeting, perhaps a time series before and after? So that's a good question. So uh, some of the data that we have, so at NADCP with MPC, uh, we are the TTA provider for the BJA grantees. And we have done a study over the last three years looking at the impact of COVID on uh, people coming in. And so we did a study and so that Rogelio uh, Strategies, they did a study. And so one of the things that we looked at in these studies was that yes, there was a drop down in uh, intakes, but one of the things was that the, the study that was done showed that the staff felt that the face-to-face -face meetings had the greater impacts. If clients started the program during COVID, they did not have the same thought about the face-to-face -face meeting as those who started the program pre-COVID who had face-to-face. -face. So those who came in during COVID who had no face-to-face, -face, they had no uh, negative impacts on the face-to-face. -face. So if that makes sense, didn't matter to them one way or the other, most of their impact had been via Zoom, via this. The other thing was that the uh, impact of not having face-to-face -face meetings did not have a significant dip uh, in what clients thought about the program or their interaction. What was interesting was that clients liked that they did not have to come to court, that many of them felt 
more comfortable opening up and talking in their own home environment as opposed. There were some who had some impact with that, but overall, uh, it wasn't as bad. But for the staff, the studies that looked at the staff, the staff did have a hard time with not doing the face-to-face -face more so than the participants did. So that was in our uh, studies that we saw of that. Most users seem to have lots of anxiety, which leads to drug use. Does anyone else notice that? And that would be for you guys to put in the chat and say yes or no. <laughs> so, uh, Kelly, did you get some uh, questions? I didn't. I, I couldn't see the ones. Some must have just been sent to you. Um, I had a I had a question on um, kind of relating to the first question. One of your statistics, did it say that people should have 90 days of sobriety before they enter the program? After or leaving, before leaving. So before leaving the program. Leaving. Okay, yeah. that you makes not sense. Want them that to makes more sense. <laughs> prior to entry. If they can do 90 days without coming into your program, they probably don't need your program. That's what I thought. Okay. Making sure I understood that correctly. Yes. Well, all right. If there are no questions, you guys get your time back. <laughs> well, thank you guys for this opportunity uh, to speak with you. Uh, I hope that if you have any other questions, I leave you in the capable hands of Marie. Have a wonderful day. Well, I guess we should take a break. Um, I don't know, Marie, do you want to start early or should we stay on schedule? I have, everybody's online. I Trust me, I know how valuable everybody's time is. So if you just want to take a break, we could start early and just, you know, keep moving along, maybe give everybody a little longer life that way. All right, let's start at 9.15. Everyone could take a 15 minute break.
Hello. Hi. So, Kelly, would you? It's, I have it that it's nine sixteen, well eleven sixteen for me. So I don't know if you want me to go ahead and get started or. Yeah. You're... I'm okay. sorry. <laughs> yeah, That's just. Okay. Couple of reminders, please keep yourself on mute um, during the presentation. And please, um, if you have questions as Marie is speaking, please put them in the chat. You can send them to just me or send them to everyone. And I will bring them up as they come up. And um, again, we are, for those of you who may have just joined us, we are starting a little early. We got done with the first speaker earlier. I am going to be putting in the chat um, Carolyn's email address and Marie's. And so I will get everyone the contact information for the speakers for questions. Um, if you have them after the training or, or want to chat, I think um, Carolyn said she'd be happy to talk to anyone. And I'm sure Marie and Anne would be too. So um, I will get the contact information to everyone. And again, please chat me or everyone so I can see the, the questions and we will ask Marie questions as she goes along. So go ahead, Marie, if you want to introduce yourself again and get started, that'd be great. All right. Well, thank you, everybody. It's a privilege to be with you. Um, I am a retired public defender. So I joined NADCP. I'm in the Justice for Events Division, as you can see from my, from my background. I'm a project director, which means I primarily work with veterans treatment courts, but I do a lot of work with adult uh, drug courts, um, um, which was my majority of my background before coming to NADCP. Um, like I said, I am a retired public defender. I graduated from law school in 91, went right into a public defender's office and ultimately became the chief public defender, my county here in Ohio. I retired in August of 21 and started my career, my second career um, with NADCP. So I love doing defense attorney stuff because, you know, that's where my heart lies. So kudos to all of you. All right, so moving forward here. Um, so um, when we talk about our role in defense attorney, uh, defense attorney on the treatment court team, these are the questions that often arise, um, not only for the defense attorneys themselves, the public defender's office, but for programs seeking to gain the participation of a defense attorney. Why should I participate? I mean, um, you know, after all, you know, clients get a lot of chances going through the treatment court. I have a really heavy caseload. Um, it, it seems to me like my my uh, time could be better served elsewhere. And then there are those who uh, feel like the the colleagues in the offices aren't treating them like a real lawyer. That somehow, because they're not um, in the traditional uh, court setting, that they're somehow they're not um, absolutely. Use, utilizing all of their litigation skills, which is absolutely wrong. They absolutely do. And so what is my role? Um, do I represent the program um, or do I represent the participants? So we're going to go over that and we're going to go, how do, how do I um, perform my role? How do I be an effective member of the team? How do I be a member of the team without just sitting back and being a team player? All right, so why? Why does a dedicated defense attorney um, need to be regularly attending staffings and court hearings and policy meetings? Well, because of our target population. I mean, we heard Carolyn talk about that, you know, treatment courts do the absolute best for our high risk, high need clients. And, you know, we know who they are. Those are the clients who we, you know, we we get, we talk a prosecutor, we eloquently argue to a judge why this individual should get another chance, why they should be placed on probation um, and, and not be sent to prison. And inevitably, we put that file away and within a few weeks, a couple months, they're coming back pretty quickly, either on a new charge or on a probation violation, right? So they're they're very frustrating clients. But we know that um, sending these clients to prison over and over is not doing anything for them, right? Um, I don't know about you, but in my 30 years, I never had a client come out of prison better 
then um, better off than before he or she went to prison. And we also see the impact of that has on their families, um, the children and, and um, how we get sometimes get caught into a generational thing. So it's because of that population of clients um, that we want to be successful, that we want them to give them the opportunities to get out of the system. That's uh, uh, a very significant reason, a great reason for us to be um, part of a treatment court team. And it restores dignity, right? Those are the clients that come into the courtroom handcuffed and shackled in the jail uniform. And they're, they're used to being told by a judge that what they've done wrong, um, that they're bad. And this is an opportunity for them to, to not be in that jail garb and to have this positive um, interaction with an authority, uh, authority figure that we know um, has a significant impact. And another reason why we should be uh, sitting at that table is because of equity inclusion issues. Now we're gonna hear later on an excellent presentation from um, and uh, Yanku uh, on, on the impact that we have on that. And we heard Carolyn say that just as being in the courtroom regularly um, uh, leads to a reduction of disparity because our courtrooms, uh, uh, because our clients see our presence there um, as an indication that the process is more fair, that they have somebody um, that we can reach out to. But we, as the de defense attorneys, we are the guardians of equity and inclusion, right? We need to make sure that those treatment courts population, they look like the rest of the population of those coming through the door, right? Those are sitting in the jail, um, those are being arrested or on probation or parole going to prison, um, that um, everybody is getting an equal shot to participate. Uh, just a little more of that research um, that Carolyn had mentioned earlier. Now, when we talk about recidivism, we talk about a two year period following the entry of drug court. That's what the uh, um, this study is based upon a two year period. So when we are there regularly and consistently, we um, increase the cost savings of the criminal justice system by 93% and we reduce recidivism by 35%. All right, so the, um, the what? Okay, what exactly is our role? Um, are we a consultant to the program um, or are we representing the clients or are we doing both? Now, I apologize, I don't know in Montana if you have any specific rules or guidance as to that issue, um, but generally um, the defense attorney serves both roles, okay? Now, for, um, there are exceptions, Georgia, for example, Georgia specifically, separates those rules and Georgia says, okay, you're gonna have defense attorney that is going to serve as your consultant to the program. And then when it comes to representing clients, um, it, it, that's, that's, gonna, uh, that's gonna be somebody else. So they divide those roles, but it can give rise, serving as both a consultant and uh, the representative of the client can can give rise to some, um, some very interesting ethical issues, which will, tap on again in a second. And I'm sure that Fred um, will get into later in his presentation. So um, it is the defense attorney who serves as the bridge between the traditional adversarial court and the collaborative problem solving of our treatment courts. Defense particip participation follows a different track um, in treatment courts, right? So instead of starting off with an assumption of conflict. Um, we and the prosecutors, we work together um, by expecting cooperation, right? And we, we have a common goal um, to reduce recidivism and to prevent the further, um, offenders further engagement with, um, with substance. So we need to learn how to advocate for the clients while maintaining a united front um, with our team. The um, defense counsel protects, we protect uh, participants due process rights while encouraging full participation, right? But the role of the defense attorney is really a continuous balancing of competing interests that can give rise to very complex um, and ethical questions and challenges. 
Um, the Fed's attorney, we are tasked with achieving the stated goals of recovery and graduation while also fulfilling ethical responsibilities in a multidisciplinary team. Um, that is why sometimes our role is uh, the most challenging. I think the defense attorney's role on a treatment court is the most challenging and sometimes the most uh, misunderstood um, by our other team members because they, they get the impression sometimes like, well, whose side um, are you on anyway? All right, so what is my role? Um, well, what are the defense counsel core competencies on a treatment team? Well, we need to evaluate the client's legal uh, situation, ensuring that the legal rights are protected and determining whether the drug court program is appropriate for the client's needs. But cases still need to be investigated, right? They still need to be reviewed um, for um, evidentiary issues. Are there legitimate factual issues in dispute? Are there constitutional challenges? Is there a great motion to suppress? You know, they still need to be uh, need to be investigated and all the options need to be uh, relayed to our client. You know, Carolyn talked about door number one and door number two. Um, well, there needs to be options and we need to investigate these ca our cases to make sure that our clients have all the, you know, is it door number one, door number two or door number three go to trial, right? So they need to, you know, we, they need to be aware of these um, things. And for some clients, drug court really isn't the best option. Legally, there may be other options that are better suited for them. And we need to ensure that our clients fully understand the program's requirements, the benefits of completion and the consequences of non-completion, right? That's part of deciding which door um, that they that they want to, to walk in is they really need to understand what they're getting into. Um, the, you know, what the drug testing, the reporting, everything they need to have a, uh, before they enter that plea, right? Knowing and voluntary. Uh, of what they're um, of what they're getting into. We um, uh, defense counsel, we oversee the treatment courts policies and practices, right? We need to make sure um, that they're equitable um, for all our clients and that we, they are not denied participation due to an inability to pay program fees. Um, some courts have exorbitant uh, costs um, uh, that are required to to complete the program um, or to continue through the program, and that just creates inequities. Um, restitution may be exorbitant, and they cannot they don't have the ability to pay. Uh, lack of transportation or stable housing. These are um, these are requirements, or these are um, Issue, these are things that we, the treatment court, should help be helping our clients establish. They should not be required to have these things before coming in to our program. And a lack of period of sobriety, right? As Carolyn said, if they could be sober on their own, um, they, don't, they don't need us, okay? So a lot of programs will have these eligibility requirements very well-intentioned, okay? Very well-intentioned but they're having negative consequences um, and creating in inequities and disparities. And we need to ensure that eligibility getting into our courts is based upon objective, legal, and clinical criteria. Objective criteria that's put in writing so everybody um, knows what the rules are, right? And when we say objective legal criteria, we don't mean that, for example, um, a motivation to change, right? We'll see sometimes programs will have that the uh, client has to exhibit a, a willingness to change, a motivation to change, a commitment to recovery. Well, the reality is a lot of our clients come into treatment courts because it's door number two and it's the better option. And they're coming in because they're legal, they're, they have the legal motivation to do that. And that's okay. That is absolutely okay, because we want the commitment to change, the commitment to recovery by the time they're ready to commence from our program. But they don't have to ha demonstrate that coming in. And besides, who are we to judge um, or accurately gauge somebody's um, uh, that subjective criteria of willingness to change? So we need to ensure that the eligibility is based upon written, objective, um, and 
legal and clinical eligibility um, requirements. We, it's very important that the defense counsel that we actively uh, participate during the treatment team staffing support process, process to ensure constitu constitutional rights are protected. Okay, drug court is court, right? It, it is still court. It may be a, a non-traditional uh, setting, but it is still court. So we need to be able to rely on our traditional litigation skills, all right? Being a non-adversarial process does not mean the same as non-advocacy, right? We are there to represent our client's interests. Um, and we need, there are times that we are going to um, need to take that traditional adversarial approach, uh, especially when liberty is at risk or there's a termination proceeding or there's any other um, questionable legal issue um, that would arise. And we need to actively participate so our uh, clients, um, so the team hears and ensures that our participants' perspectives are heard and um, respected. The reality is that sometimes our clients, you know, they have legitimate issues that need to be risen, right? Um, and they're not able to articulate those um, issues. And, and perhaps a judge um, or the prosecutor um, when they're saying that in open in um, in the court hearing may not take it as seriously as um, as if the the defense attorney had brought it up um, during the staffing. So there are some there are legitimate things that we need to relay on behalf of our clients, and our clients need to be able to know that they can reach out to us. So we are there to make sure that their perspectives are heard and respected. We are there to remind team members to stay in their own lanes, okay? Um, treatment court team is made up of uh, essentially a panel of expert witnesses for the judge, but we need to stay in our own lanes. Um, so we need to remind, you know, um, uh, uh, treatment people not to give legal advice, right? Um, and we as defense attorneys should not be making recommendation as to treatment. Everybody stays in their own lanes and we help to remind um, the other team members when, when they veer off course. We need to continually advocate for the mission of probation violation and other aggravating cases with clients who have substantial records. Bottom line is the people, um, these higher value clients have the, get the biggest bang for their buck. Um, in our criminal justice system, right? We need to be diverting, uh, constantly arguing uh, for the mission of these higher value clients, diverting people uh, from client, uh, diverting people from uh, prison incarceration. Now, I get it. Sometimes um, uh, states have um, statutes um, or laws barring um, prohibitions for ch those charged with drug dealing or violent histories. Um, there's nothing we can do if that's written into your um, into your state law, but the evidence has shown um, that if it's not a, a legal prohibition for you, that if they can be managed safely in your court, they absolutely should be taken because they have great outcomes um, and do very well in our treatment courts. So we are the ones that need to be there constantly advocating for their mission. Marie, we have a question. Oh, yes. Um, do you think the defense attorney should sit with them during their drug court appearance as a defense attorney would in a normal criminal proceeding? Um, you know what? That um, I think that would be entirely up to um, uh, you know, that's a good question. I I have not seen that, but that doesn't mean that it's not inappropriate. I guess really when we're talking about what's the comfort level of the client, right? Does would the client um, like that like you there, um, sitting with them, or just knowing that you're in the room, saying you know, knowing that you um, that person can talk to you quickly before they go see go up in front of the judge, or they can say, you know what, judge, can I can I ask my can I ask the defense attorney, the public defender, a question? So that would really be the dynamic of your courtroom and your status hearings um, as far as that. But I would always relay to, I guess, the comfort level 
of the client and what the, the client sees um, would, is in their best interest. We, yeah, if people want to put in what they do, I see Nathan Prohaska states he always accompanies his client at the table. I did also. So, um, but I think what Marie said is, you know, what's kind of the regular procedure in your drug treatment court kind of follow that. Yeah, absolutely. And, you know, and I'm sure it's, you know, whatever the client um the client wishes but that, yeah there's that i mean if if that's how your your court program is set up that you're sitting at the table and as each participant's called up they come and sit next to you love it yeah there's certainly you know and if that's not if that doesn't happen you know you're sitting along the side with the rest of the team that's great too so whatever works best for your program and your participants thank you okay so um, it's also our duty to contribute to our the team's um, the program's efforts in the community education and local resource acquisition. You know, part of the um, part of the effort of getting our high value clients into programs is because um, you'll have, let's say, for example, your elected prosecutor or an elected judge a little fearful that the community. Um, won't accept those type of offenders um, into the program, that, that the community response would be negative. So part of expanding that potential eligibility for those clients is, is educating the community um, as to what it really means, uh, what drug treatment court is, that it's not a walk in the park, that it's, you know, not easy peasy. Um, and on the research of, of the, uh, of the, of the positive impact on the community. So we need to be you know, educating, be part of the effort in educating our community. That also brings in community resources, right? Um, as other um, state you know, people in your community, there may be something your program needs and there's an organization that could provide that to your participants. They just don't know. Um, they just don't know what you need. So educating the community can help bring in um, organizations. And sometimes it's, educating the fellow members of the defense bar, right? So I found that, you know, like in my county, you know, we, the public defender's office, we were on top of obviously all the ins and outs of the treatment courts, but some, you know, members of the defense bar, not in general, not so much. So organize a CLE, you know, organize one over lunch. Everybody loves a free credit or two, right? So, um, you know, um, that's another uh, competency for you as the defense attorney on your team. Um, the, um, we want to be a member of the team without just being a team player, right? We're just not going to sit there and go along with the masses. So how do we do that? We need to be knowledgeable and we need to engage in ongoing training. We need to have effective communication with the clients, the participants in our program. And we need to have engaged and effective communication um, with the team. Um, we have another question, Marie. Yes. Um, <clears throat> Steve Fletcher, um, my experience is that getting a client into treatment and treatment court in the context of a plea agreement is the attorney's job. My understanding is that the treatment court merely monitors the client's continued participation in recovery, but the attorney's role is over unless there is a major violation, i.e. a revocation hearing. The question of guilt and innocence no longer exists, so it is a good idea. So is it a good idea to stay to continue to stay involved? Is it even possible if you are an appointed public defender? All right. Uh, those are great questions. So really, you know, depends on the type of uh, of the system that you have um, in, in your in your particular jurisdiction. So, for example, in in my county, the majority of the clients, the majority of the participants in our treatment courts were public defender clients. Okay, obviously, I do not represent every single one of those individuals in their journey to get into the court. Right, there were. Cases are assigned to assistant public defenders, um, and it's 
it was their duty to um, adequately, you know, explain all the legal options to um, make sure that they understood what they were getting into before uh, beco becoming a, be being admitted to the program and going through all the, the, the process of the plea agreement that got them into the program. Once they were in the program, I was the uh, defense attorney, the public defender who sat on our treatment court. Sometimes I was counsel of record coming in, um, but obviously not for everybody. Um, but once they came into the program, I was seen as, as their counsel. All right. So ever, um, so even though uh, another attorney from the public defender's office represented them, even though they had other appointed counsel uh, when they came into the program, um, or if they had retained counsel, that the participants in the program saw me as the person, the go-to person um, during that process. So if there was problems, they called me. Um, and then when it came to other than further legal proceedings, say as a termination hearing, um, if they had retained counsel, they would go back to the retained counsel. Um, if it was somebody from the public defender's office, I just did it. Um, now, I will tell you, some states are really grappling with this, um, um, like Minnesota, I'll tell you about Minnesota. The Minnesota State Public Defender's Office position is that, hey, once they've entered a plea, we're out, okay? Once you plea and sentenced, we're out, um, unless there's a formal violation um, filed, we're not, we're not participating in, in treatment courts. Um, they, there was a uh, recent um, appellate case that came out that said, Mm, um, as long as they're, even though they're on probation, um, there's still that con continuing legal threat. They're still under the um, authority and the jurisdiction of the court that your duty to them has not ended. So um, I, I guess the long uh, way around that is that really depends how you set that up in your jurisdiction. But the person who's sitting on that team needs to be aware um, that the other the participants are seeing you as their attorney. So however you work that, that you then are the bridge to the, the attorney who's going to do the vi probation, um, probation violation hearing or the termination hearing, um, you need to have, you know, that communication, that bridge. I hope that adequately answers the question. Marie, can I just yeah. clarify something in your, your presentation today? So, um, and I think there probably is a lot of confusion between OPD attorneys, like actual public defender attorneys working for the state here in Montana, and then contract attorneys, defense attorneys who represent them. Is, is, it, is it true that your training today is basically for the public defenders, the attorneys that are the defense counsel at the staffings, at the court hearings? That's what you're talking about today. Is that correct? I am. Okay. Okay. Yes, I am. So if you're if you're the attorney sitting, you know, in this, you're the designated attorney for this program. This is who I'm primarily speaking to. Right. Now, some of the, you know, these other core competencies I talked about, um, about you know, make knowledge of the 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 roles and you know, knowledge of the expectations and the of the program. You know, we have to remember that sometimes our colleagues, our defense colleagues, aren't very well I don't do a great job of explaining that so sometimes we have to bridge the gaps on those um on those type of things of when somebody new comes into the program that they they understand what is expected of them but yes the this presentation is primarily dedicated to those who actually sit in the sit in these programs right okay and it's and it's my understanding that most of our treatment OPD staffs at least most of the treatment courts around the state. So that is how we do it. Other attorneys may get, the defense attorneys may get the client into the treatment court, but once there, there's an OPD or OPD contracts with the defense attorney to be that role in that treatment court. Great, great, excellent. Okay, so another part of our role is that um, we need to, ensure that our program's policies and procedures are up to date and really reflect what's going on in our programs, okay? When was the last time any of you read the, your program's policies and procedures manual, right? We, you know, our programs start and like so many other programs do, you know, we copy and paste. 
we find we get another program's written uh, manuals and we copy them because why reinvent the wheel? The problem is they're never looked at again and they don't accurately reflect of what's going on um, in your program. So it's very important, um, I think, for the defense attorney to like make to make sure that what is go what is written in that manual is what's really going on. Okay. Um, we also need to ensure that our clients receive a handbook that is easily understood. How many times um, I've had I have read so, um, a program is called Participants Handbook, and all it is is the policies and procedure manual ripping off the first page and replacing the first page. It says Participants Handbook. Okay, it's worthless. All right, we need to make sure that our participants understand that book and consider it a resource, all right? So NADCP recommends that they obviously be easily understood, that they be written at a sixth grade level. So we public defenders, we need to be reviewing those handbooks and making sure that um, they are um, something that our clients can easily understand. And we also, again, need to make, sh make sure that they see it as a resource, all right? So if they need um, contact information, um, they need to be told what they're getting from the program, right? Not just the rules, um, not just the rules of what's expected from them. That handbook should reflect what they can expect from our program. And we want to, you know, watch the tone of these handbooks. Again, I've seen handbooks that, were written in capital letters like you shall and you will be honest and and frankly sent this book the tone of the book sound like the, the person is being yelled at and so what what a what client of mine would want to go into that program um being you know um dealt with like that from the very beginning so take a look at those written uh, materials and we need to be knowledgeable in, in our ongoing training and keep up on issues involving involving risk and need and the recovery process of evidence-based treatment. Um, what's the latest research on the set of sanctions and therapeutic adjustments? Uh, on, are we keeping up with drug and alcohol testing and then all the new drugs coming into the our system? Best practice standards, um, which I will tell you that the adult drug, adult drug court um, best practice standards are currently going under a revision. Um, that they are being updated with all the latest research and they are being revised right now. And um, it was originally anticipated that they would be unveiled at conference in Houston this year. Um, that's not going to happen, but hopefully we'll have those by the end of the year, but they'll be completely updated. So we want to keep up on that. And of course, um, due process and case law um, issues as they come up. Um, some just some quick links. Um, there's the link to the best practice standards. Again, soon they're going to be updated. Um, if you've never checked out the case law tab, uh, NDC, um, at the NDCI, this tab, um, it's continually updated as new case law impacting from all over the country, um, impacting tr treatment courts. That, that's a great quick uh, research. And if you want, um, you want to watch some videos, you know, you need to you need a refresher on drug testing. You need a refresher um, on incentive sanctions like that. You know, you need a refresher or something um, right there. The e-learning, you can create an account for free and um, you can watch videos, um, great uh, uh, videos to keep you up to date on um, issues that impact us. Okay, kind of getting back to what we were talking about just a few minutes ago. Um, you know, it's very important the communication with the clients, right? Because whether or not we're counsel of record, um, we are the team's defense attorney and clients, whether we represented them as before they came into the program, they're going to see us as that, right? They're going to see us somebody to seek advice, um, um, to ask questions. So even though we are not going to be representing that individual as a, a um, Due process, a due process hearing, a violation hearing, a termination hearing. Um, we we've had contact with them, and we need to be pre be prepared to collaborate with the, the with the attorney who's going to be handling that record. Um, make sure that they are completely up to date um, and have the best possible defense prepared for our clients. 
Um, we know that communication with clients is very important um, in building that relationship, right? We want them to trust us. We, they want, we want them to trust the advice we give them. We want them to be honest with us. So that communication is very important because, you know, you know, we know, um, you know, if I knew if I, um, you know, went into the jail to meet a brand new client and I started off with, um, oh yeah, I saw the video. I saw the store video. You're clearly, your face, you're clearly identified. You clearly hold a gun up to this clerk's face. Yeah, you're screwed. Um, so let's talk about how many years you're willing to, to take, right? If I started off a conversation with a brand new client that way, I would have completely shut that client down, right? So we need to start off at, um, our communication and discussion with our clients. So they trust us. Um, they, they accept our advice and they're completely honest uh, with us because we need to um, have a strategy with them. You know, we need to explain to them they're not always going to be happy with, say, treatment recommendations, right? Um, but what is in their best interest? Like, what is their stated interest, uh, their legal interest, and why they come into this court, and what's in their best interest proceeding? Because they're not always going to be happy. So we need to have that communication with them because we are part of the therapeutic alliance, right? We are there to um, ensure that our clients um, successfully complete our programs. Um, communication with the team, all right? We, we're defense lawyers. We want to object. We want to um, get in that adversarial mode. So um, we, we need to be careful with the type of communication um, that we have um, with our team. Um, now, non-adversarial does not mean non-advocacy, right? Um, but again, we're, we're trained in that adversarial process. So we sometimes tend to make arguments um, when we could be, uh, we'd be more productive in doing something else, okay? So we need, uh, communication with the team is critical in creating those relationships that will help us to find the collaboration and the problem solving um, that is in the best interest for our clients. So the threshold skill is knowing when to argue and when to do something else instead, right? Uh, we need to uh, develop a problem solving style and um, reserve that adversarial approach um, when addressing issues that, that really warrant them. So how do we do that? What's some of the, um, the, the techniques that we can employ when doing that? Well, we can um, employ inclusiveness. You know, we want to um, make sure that every team member has the opportunity to weigh in uh, without cross-examining them, right? I know the temptation is to cross-examine them, but let them um, um, have, make sure that everybody has the opportunity to speak um, and the opportunity to weigh in. And we need to employ active listening and empathy. Um, we need to, to rem remind ourselves what the viewpoint from which the team member is sharing um, their opinion um, and their information. And um, we want to listen um, to everybody before, uh, before responding, right? We don't want to jump in again and cross-examine um, and make an argument to the contrary when we haven't listened um, to everybody's opinion and from the, the viewpoint that they are sharing it. We want to avoid those ego-centered communications, right? This is not about winning an argument. This is about what the, um, or being right, or so winning an argument is about coming to a solution, us problem solving. So it comes out in the best interest for our clients. Because in the end, that's all we want. We want our clients to successfully complete this program um, and receive the, the legal benefit and hopefully, um, uh, sustain a, a journey of recovery. So let's keep the issues at hand. It's not about winning an argument about being right. And we need to, um, you know, reinforce other statements and find common ground, right? Express our appreciation to the team members, whether we, you know, whether we personally agree with or not. Um, but we need to, um, you know, again, find that common ground. All right, so people sometimes will ask me, um, so what are some examples of things that a defense attorney would say 
um, in a staffing, for example. Okay, so this is just a few examples this slide and the next slide of, of some things that a defense attorney would say. So for example, a defense attorney might say, well, you know, the level of care being discussed is not in line with the recommendation from treatment, right? So maybe we're hearing the prosecutor or maybe even the judge kind of getting off kilter as to a treatment recommendation. And we want to remind them treatment um, makes a recommendation about treatment um, because if our clients are getting the appropriate level of care, either they're getting not enough medicine or they're getting too much medicine, it's gonna be harmful. So we wanna keep people in their own lanes. Um, another thing might be, you know, I recommend highlighting the positive compliant behavior of the client this week and allowing me the opportunity to discuss with him the non-compliance issues. Perhaps there's another issue or barrier that have not identified. So again, we're advocating on behalf um, of the client before we just, you know, um, putting out there's like, look judge, you know, look team, you know, let me give, give me the opportunity to talk to this individual. Um, maybe there's something else we haven't identified. Let's not just jump in and do that sanction this week. Give me the, give me some time. Uh, another is watching out for disparities, right? So, um, you know, you might say I agree, a sanction is appropriate, but the sanction um, is not in line with other um, sanctions provided to, to clients who committed similar violations during the same phase. So you can agree that a sanction is absolutely appropriate, but it could be disparate in, under those circumstances. So we need, um, we're there to remind our team of those issues. Again, we, we need to advocate for our client's stated interest, okay? Um, often, um, this happened often that when clients um, believe that they were going to be recommended for a residential level of care, this often came up. And we know from our, it's very traumatic. Um, this was, um, you know, this, you know, um, this first uh, statement, you know, I would have, a, I had a client who called um, because like, who's going to take care of my pets when I'm in residential treatment? I don't trust anybody. What's going to happen to them? And, sh and she was distraught. It was my duty to add, to bring those interests to the team, to advocate for her on that behalf. Now she did go into residential treatment, but we were able to problem solve and um, and have her, her, her beloved animals well taken care of during uh, her, the time in residential treatment. So you need to bring those interests, you know, you're there to advocate for stated interests. Um, due process, if the client says they didn't do it, um, then they did, you know, we need to, there are due process and constitutional issues. If they say they didn't do it, then um, we need to proceed accordingly. When clients are being discussed for termination, you know, you know, we want them to be successful. So you might say, well, I heard treatment saying there are alter alternatives. So we haven't exhausted judge all of our, um, all of our avenues. So let's give this another try. And finally, you know, we get to know our participants pretty well. And so you may have a recommendation for a sentence that you think would be very, especially beneficial, um, impactful for a client. So those are just some examples of things that a defense attorney would say uh, during a staffing. So memorandum, memorandums of understanding. NADCP recommends that every um, agency that's represented on a treatment team have an MOU, okay? Because it establishes their, uh, our specific responsibilities and expectations. So it's obviously it's a written agreement between the court and the other, or, and the other organizations for services um, and um, coordination. So what is great um, for these MOUs because they define our responsibilities to the program or the team, right? They set forth that, okay, the public defender's office will have somebody in attendance at, at team staffings and court hearings. They will be present um, for policy meetings. They will or will not handle due process hearings. What, what is the process for that? You know, depending on the situation of your program, you know, who does the due process hearings? You know, if there's a termination hearing, who handles that? So you want to define your responsibilities, um, excuse me, to your program or to your team. And you need to, uh, you know, identify in the MOU your responsibilities to the participants, okay? There are going to be confidentiality, confidentiality issues. Attorney client privilege doesn't go out the window, right? The, the participants see you as the, they know you're the team's defense attorney. They're, they're um, reaching out to you to seek advice, all right? That's attorney-client privilege. So you need to identify that, you know, I still, 
I still have these responsibilities and I'm there to protect constitutional rights and represent stated interests. Likewise, these MOUs are great for establishing the team's responsibility to you, especially in regards to exchange of information. Okay, I want to know before staffing, you know, everybody else is getting information 48 hours before, you know, I need to review this, the, these reports. Why is it just going to certain people? I want to copy these reports. One thing that, you know, or email communications, one thing that would burn me as I show up to a staff meeting, um, a staffing, and they'd be talking about an email, something happened with one of my clients. Uh, you know, a few days ago, and there was an email. Well, I wasn't on that email chain, okay? So establish the team responsibilities to you as well, not just you to them that, you know, you need to put me in that email. All right, critical issues for defense attorneys. Very exciting to announce. This came out 20 years ago in 2003. We are almost done with the rewrite of this, the updated uh, critical issues for defense attorneys in drug court, and it includes some new stuff in there, including compassion fatigue. That, like I said, that is in the final edits, and um, that will be coming out. Um, we should have that in Houston. Um, when we're, we're there for conference, so very excited about that. The um, um, NADCP puts on practitioner specific trainings. Um, there is a defense attorney one this year. It is, you see here, September. in September, um, it's in Oklahoma City. It's four days, um, and it's a deep dive for defense attorneys, and we get into um, a lot of stuff. Um, uh, two, you know, uh, deep dives into drug testing, psychopharmacology, motivational interviewing, SUD recurrence, post-traumatic stress and brain disorders, um, professional and ethics issues, incentives and sanctions. I mean, the whole whole nine yards. So um, just something to, to keep in mind if you're interested. Um, again, if you were aware, um, the National Conference RISE is, um, registration is open for that as well. That's in last week in June in Houston. And that is it. So we moved right along here. So I don't know if there's any other questions. All right, I see here some here. Okay. There's a couple things in the chat that might spark some. Um, Eleanor, you said um, in response to the uh, Steve Fletcher's um, experience of getting clients into treatment court, and then the that attorney really has nothing more to do unless there's a major violation. You said that isn't how treatment court works in the vet court in Butte. Eleanor, do you want to um, expand on that, how it's different? Can you unmute yourself? You're muted. Hello, sorry, I got a call from a client, so I'm talking to them. Oh, sorry. Thanks, Eleanor. Um, there were some more. Um, Colin here in Missoula pointed out that Voc Rehab has been a great resource that they've been able to provide treatment court participants. Each VOC rehab office has an individual designated to assist with drug court participants. Sherry Reed can assist you in finding the designated person. And he left the um, email. Is, is that around the state, Colin? Is Colin on? Yes, it's statewide. Okay, so any drug treatment court has a voc rehab uh, person designated to help with the participants? Yes, well, each office has a designated person to help with drug court participants. It doesn't seem like it's a very utilized tool, um, but at the conference that they had, um, 
earlier this year, they went over that. Okay, well, thank you for that. Yeah, I'd like to point out to Eleanor's comment, because um, she really dives into a lot of, you know, hits a lot of great points um, of all the issues that we went through. Um, she says she communicates regularly with all the team members, um, uh, adult PNP, I'm assuming that's policy and procedure, the monitoring folks, mental health, um, and um, CD professionals, um, and the clients to make sure the client's needs are being met. I meet with the clients on a manner of issues to address barriers or issues. I've helped clients get into housing, get into additional service, get gift cards to help meet financial needs, get travel vouchers. We also monitor progress at all levels and compliance to show clients are moving through the tiers of the program and moving towards completion as quickly as possible. I do a ton of cheerleading and provide assurance and encouragement. We do make legal arguments in treatment court, but in an informal, um, but then we'd have to argue X and that would kind of way. Right, so she's, she's got uh, that therapeutic alliance with her clients. She's looking out for their interests. She's checking in. Um, She's there to, to advocate for their stated interests. Um, she's ha she's you know, monitoring her communication with her fellow team members. She's you know, making arguments without putting them off by doing that traditional, like we feel like we need, you know, gets us riled up in a courtroom kind of way. Um, so yeah, great comment. Um, good information, Eleanor. Eleanor, thank you for sharing. Okay. Well, if there's no more questions, we do have another break. And then we have Fred um, Snodgrass at 1045. Um, I'm not sure he's going to be available early, but we'll see. Um, why don't we just take a half hour break and start a little before 1045? like 1040. And I will make sure Fred is available. And again, I will get, um, Marie, was your email address up on your PowerPoint? No. Mm -mm. Okay. Um, I, I will be posting the PowerPoints. Um, and I, again, I will post um, email addresses so you can contact people if you do have questions later on. So uh, we'll take a little break and we'll see you guys back in a bit.
Reb, there's still some people coming in. Um, so let's give it just one more minute and then maybe you can get started. Do you want me to start at 1045? No, you can start in a minute. Um, okay. I'm guessing there's some people that are jumping on just to hear you. So <laughs> we'll give them a, another minute or two. Okay. Well, go ahead, Fred. Um, I did a little introduction for you at the beginning, but why don't you go ahead and if you want to introduce yourself a little bit and get started, that would be great. And oh, and I wanted to let everyone know um, Fred is going to ask answer questions at the end, but feel free to put in the chat to everyone or to me any questions you have as he's presenting, and then he will get two questions at the end. Thank you. Good morning, everybody. Kelly, can you hear me okay or am I too loud? No, perfect. Great, all right. Well, my name is Fred Snodgrass. I'm an attorney here in Billings. I don't know what they told you about uh, my introduction, but what I can tell you is that um, I'm really tall. You can't tell that um, from the video probably. Uh, but I always tell my clients, if you're looking for me in the in the courthouse, just look for the really tall guy with dark hair and you'll find me. Um, anyway, uh, I'm presenting on ethics today, and so we'll just get going with that. I'm going to turn my video off and start this. Kelly, can you still hear me all right? Yep, can hear you and we see your PowerPoint. Okay, great. One all second, right, well, Fred, this is Kevin. Hey, sorry. Um, we are seeing your notes and your outline, if, if that's okay, too. But What do you mean by the notes? You mean the next slide version or? The outline, whatever. Yeah, next slide. Okay, that's fine. However you have it. It's good. So I don't know how to change that other than... Um, Sorry, everyone. Uh, this oh, is my first okay. uh, Zoom, so let's let's switch that. Uh, you know, I don't think it really matters. It's just the next slide. I I thought it was your notes at first. Well, well, his, his notes. If you have notes, they will be shown. So it should be sharing. <laughs> If, if you take it, Fred, if you take it out of presenter mode, um, if you have your slideshow, but not in presenter mode, then it will just be the slides. If that helps you in any way. It does, but I don't know how to do that. So, um, well, I'm not, I, I guess if you, uh, if you all can see the side, I wanted the, to fill the screen though. So I want the view that everybody can see is the full screen that I have on my monitor. So maybe if I just switch over to, to not a screen share mode, but just um, 
<laughs> I'll get this done. Sorry. But we're starting ahead of time, right? So I have 15 right. minutes to get this you, figured you, out, right? You're fine. Yeah, you're totally fine. Okay. Now I feel bad. I probably shouldn't have said anything, but. Oh, don't feel bad. I the only person on my screen that I can see is Roberta. So I, she looks like she's taking notes on how to do this. And now we're seeing the full screen. So I think we're good. Okay, yeah. great. And I see on my right, I see everybody's picture. So is everybody, I need to make that small. There we go. All right. Okay, so we'll start. How about that? <clears throat> and Kelly, you can still hear me all right? Yes. Okay. So I've been asked to present on the ethical issues for defense attorneys and treatment courts. And so I, I'll get going with that. Um, first off, I like this uh, slide, this uh, picture I saw on the internet. Of course, um, it kind of sets the tone for the list that you're about to see, which is the outline of what we're going to do today. First, we're going to talk about the rules of professional responsibility that are things that I think are, are ones that we need to pay particular attention to in treatment courts, uh, the treatment court statutes and how they interplay with the rules. We've got some pre-submitted questions that we're going to go through. I'll give you a summary and then we'll have some time for questions. Just so you know, when I put a screen up, everyone, I'll, I'll be silent for a moment there while you have an opportunity to read that slide and then I'll talk about it. What's important to, to know and remember in a treatment court is that um, everybody there is in the, they're in the collaborative process. Uh, it's non-adversarial, as we all know, um, yet you still don't leave your role as defense attorney. And your job there is to protect your client's rights and their liberty interests. And specifically, you have an ethical duty to protect those both for the individual client and then for all the participants who are on the court. That doesn't mean that you're... Uh, representing everyone at once in the team meeting, and you're a part of the team, so you don't have confidentiality with the client. What I mean specifically is that uh, when a recommendation is made for one client, you need to make sure that that recommendation, whether it's an incentive or a sanction, is equitably applied. And then, of course, if there's any loss of liberty, that you're protecting their due process rights, both in the staffing meeting and uh, with the client in the courtroom. In the Montana Rules of Professional Responsibility, the preamble uh, one um, is pursuit of the truth. And, and we've heard, and you may not have heard yet, but uh, treatment courts are courts of honesty. I hear judges say that a lot, and that's very important because um, there's lots of sayings about how um, substance use disorder works. And the, in my opinion, the best friend of the substance use disorder is uh, lying and not telling the truth. And what's important in the treatment court is that your clients are telling the truth when they're at the podium, especially when it involves their use. Remember, they should never be punished uh, with any type of incarceration uh, for use. They might be punished for lying about their use, but they should not be punished for their use. Cramble nine, that's something that you have to balance while you're in the treatment court. And I think it's important to remember that that's one of the preambles to the Montana Rules of Professional Responsibility is the clients, the legal system, and being a public system. And that's what treatment courts are about, is providing rehabilitation for these clients, our, particip or our clients and participants in the legal system, and restoring them back to being uh, productive citizens. Preamble 10, uh, I'll read that one. Virtually all difficult ethical problems arise from conflict between a lawyer's responsibilities to clients, to the legal system, and to the lawyer's own interests. I think it's important in Preamble 10 is that the responsibility of the clients and the legal system, you're in that situation when you are a member of a team, a treatment court team, and you also represent an individual who's in the treatment court. That immediately puts you in a potential conflict, and that's what we're going to be talking about today.
I don't know if anyone's ever had this happen to their grandmother and then been solicited by an attorney, um, but we all know there are certain rules that apply all the time, and we all have a general understanding of the rules, but there are particular rules that we must pay attention to in, treatment, in the treatment court setting. Rule 1.1 competence requires you to not only know the statutes and not only be an effective attorney uh, for your clients, but it also requires you to know what's expected in the treatment court. So when we start talking about the treatment programs, it's not that you're required to know what IOP is or what uh, outpatient treatment is or what even day treatment involves uh, the difference between inpatient and day treatment. But what requires what, what you are required to know is that there are the various treatment programs involved in your court and what those programs are for and how they may be a therapeutic response to a use or a certain behavior as opposed to sanctioning the, the, the excuse me, the participant for their conduct. So when a defendant in the court violates the treatment court contract, everybody always looks to how do we sanction that behavior? And what you need to do as a defense attorney is make sure that you're looking at not to sanction the behavior, but is there a way that we can incentivize the good behavior? Because we know that incentives work, work much better than sanctions. And also, is a sanction appropriate or do we need a therapeutic response from treatment? So don't be afraid at the table to ask that. That's a part of your competence. Ask the treatment providers, what can we do to curb this behavior? You need to know the incentives and what they're used for in the court and how those sanctions and incentives are applied to individuals in your court requires you to make sure as the defense attorney and the staffing to assure that they're all provided equitably to everybody who's participating in the court. You need to know what can get your client terminated or the participant terminated from the court. You need to know if there's a policy for certain things or at least understand how your judge responds to certain types of behaviors. Uh, in the steer court here in Billings, we started out where if somebody was driving while suspended and they were in our court and they were not allowed to drive, they got a jail sanction. And again, this is 13 years ago when we started that court, they got a jail section and they were looking at termination potentially because they just could not be driving. And over the course of times, we still have sanctions for termination, but we're not looking at specific, or excuse me, sanctions for the driving if they are not a licensed driver. But we are not looking towards termination at that point. We're looking at curbing the behavior because we've come to understand over the course of time that that's a better result for that person and anyone else in the court to see that we're willing to still work with them even though they continue to make mistakes. You need to know what the confidentiality waivers are and at least have reviewed those. You can advise a client to sign a confidentiality waiver if you don't know what it says. And also to the restrictions placed on the government's use of information that's obtained in the drug court. That can be a hot topic. I know that most teams discuss this at some point. And I think the thing to remember there is that you need to make sure that you have an educated position when this topic comes up. If someone is doing something that the prosecutor says, I think this needs to be handled differently or outside of the court. Rule 1.2 scope. This is uh, very important. It's the scope of representation in the rules and it directly applies to uh, some of the best practices and, and best practices show us that if the prosecutor, the defense attorney, the judge, the key members of the team are present at staffings and we have better outcomes. Of course, you need to be present at court proceedings. That could be by video, that could be in person, but you need to be present if there's a court hearing. And it's imperative that you're present during just a regular court docket. Rule 1.4, communication. Rule 1.4b, a lawyer shall explain a matter to the extent reasonably necessary to permit the client to make informed decisions regarding the representation. 
This is important, obviously, or it wouldn't be on the slide, right? So your clients have choices and they may be Hobbesian choices. The choice may be, I, I am either gonna come into a treatment court or I'm gonna go to prison. But that's still a choice that they need to make. And when you're advising them to make that decision, you need to know what's going on in the treatment court if you are not representing them in the treatment court, because sometimes this takes place before the participant gets in. But they also need to know what they're getting into. And that basically takes place when you review the contract with them. As a treatment court attorney, you should be reviewing the contract with your client the participant who's coming in, even if their defense counsel in the case that gets them to the treatment court reviews the contract with them, you need to review the contract with them. That's a part of what you need to be able to do. And you need to be able to make sure that client understands contractually, legally, what they're getting themselves into. You should also inform the client that they cannot be ordered to attend treatment court by a judge. I know that there are judges in the state of Montana who will order participants, or excuse me, order a defendant as a part of the sentencing to complete a treatment court. Unless that person wants to do the treatment court, that's something you should be objecting to because the premise of treatment courts is a voluntary choice to be in the court. So you can't let that slip through. However, once they choose to come into the treatment court, then certainly they can be ordered to complete the program or ordered to graduate. Communication practice tip is I've found over the years that uh, the biggest conflict that I have with clients when I sit down and talk with them is they want to know what my role on the team is and that since I'm on the team, am I advocating for them or against them? Where do I fit? And clearly, as a team member, there's going to be conversations in staffing that you're not necessarily going to be able to convey to your client. However, uh, you have a duty to that client, and you also have to convey what the client needs to know. And that comes in usually the form of an allegation. And if your treatment court is having you convey that allegation to your client, I'm telling you that sets up a problem. It's a direct communication problem. It requires you to be the messenger. And the client is immediately, typically, immediately not on the same page with you. And they want to defend themselves to you, wherein what they need to be able to do is have you on their team. So my practice tip here is that when you are told of a violation of the contract by the team, or it comes up in staffing, comes up in an email, and you're going to speak with the client about it, it's best to have the probation officer on your team, or if you have a law enforcement officer on the team, have them present the allegation to your client, and then you kick them out of the room and talk to your client about the allegation. Rule 1.6, candor. This typically comes up where someone reaches out to you and, and they say, hey, I used or I've got a new offense. Um, what do I do? And the answer to them should be, since you're in the treatment court, let's first look at being honest about it. Let's own up to it. And let's proceed uh, in the treatment court setting to deal with it. A lot of times, we have violations of the contract that do not go prosecuted because they're dealt with in the treatment court setting. And that's a benefit for your client. However, your clients also got to admit that they engaged in the conduct. But remember rule 1.6 says a lawyer shall not reveal information unless the client gives informed consent. And remember informed consent is usually in writing or at least it's on the record. So if you're going to be disclosing something to the treatment court, that your client revealed to you, you need to make sure that you have informed consent from the client and that when you reveal it, you're revealing it in the most constructive manner possible.
you're going to have that issue where, and I know this should be a question that somebody might have, you're going to have that issue where you have to weigh your candor to the tribunal and your duty to your client. And make no mistake, even with making sure that your clients are, are working towards the truth and you're helping them with their substance use disorder, you also have to maintain that responsibility, that duty to your client. And if your client does not want the team to know, you are not going to say anything about it. If the court asks about it, you may be forced to withdraw from the representation before you let your client lie about it once the client's revealed something to you. What we're talking about uh, could be perceived as a lack of candor. If you don't, relay something to the team that you're a vital part of, if you don't relay something to the judge who presides over that team. But again, your duty to your client outweighs the candor to the court. And of course, that I've answered that, so I'll move on. I think no matter how implausible somebody's story might be, if it's your client or your participant's story and they don't waver in it, as long as you don't know it's a lie, uh, you need to present it. And when you have a hearing or if you have hearings or if you're in staffing and you're presenting your client's position, even if it's something you're not sure of or you just think it's implausible, as long as you don't know it's a lie and that's what they want you to present, that's what you need to present. I caution you to strongly encourage them though that that's not very plausible, remind them courts, treatment courts are courts of honesty. And remember that when admitting use, there should not be punishment associated with that use, meaning not a sanction. There should be a therapeutic response. Fred? Can yes. I stop you? And I'm I'm sorry, I know you wanted questions at the end, but I think there's a, a few people that weren't here during Marie's presentation. And um what what I asked Marie during her presentation, we have a lot of contract attorneys on here today. And I just want to clarify and, and make sure you and I are on the same page. This presentation is for OPD attorneys as defense counsel in treatment courts. Is that correct? Correct. Okay. So those contract attorneys that are on, they may rep they represent the client up until they get into treatment court. Their representation is done. And what you're training on is OPD defense attorneys in that that represent all the clients in treatment court, correct? That is correct. Okay. I think there's some confusion on that. Would you like me to touch on that just briefly? Yeah, if you could. Okay. So I think what's important is as a defense attorney, a contract attorney, or even an OPD attorney who is not actually working on the treatment court, to have a good idea of what your client's getting into and be able to advise them. For example, you could get the contract from the treatment court team and talk to the client about that. And there may be information that you can't answer, but at least the clients had a chance to look at that contract with you. Um, the other thing is that, you know, this comes up on occasion in billings and it probably comes up elsewhere. Wherein we're not sure as a contract attorney or as a OPD attorney, why our client was denied. And I'll touch on that a little bit uh, down here, but what's important is to understand that the defense attorney who is on the team, it is imperative for them to assure that a client who is coming into the court has what I would say an equitable screening. And I, I don't want to go too far ahead on the slides, but we're talking about this now. I want to talk about it now. When you refer someone you probably just get they were accepted or they were denied and nothing else. And that's because the staffing is not something that is recorded and staffing is not something that is shared with anyone. And so when there's a defense attorney on that staffing, that defense attorney's role there is to assure that your client was treated fairly, equitably, given the due process. You have to weigh that in the fact that um, you're not, you don't have a right to be in a treatment court. 
And I don't see a case out there that says that you have a right to be equitably screened for a treatment court or that there's due process in the screening for a treatment court. But I can tell you that I don't see how you don't have due process, at least through the rules of professional responsibility, to a client who's coming into a treatment court. So remember that if you're on a, on a treatment court, there's a defense attorney who's out there who's referred their client. And while they may not be able to get an answer from you as to why their client was denied, they probably won't ask if the client was accepted. But you need to assure as a member of the team that everyone who applies is equitably treated by that team. They're not treated arbitrarily or capriciously. I think that's something to remember as a contract attorney. And then other than that, Kelly, I don't know. I'd ask for a show of hands, but I don't know how to make that work. I bet there's probably a lot of people on here just for ethics, Clee, because they're hard to come by. Yeah. No, I, th I think, and, and there was a comment in, um, in the chat also that, you know, I think it's important for the contract attorneys to know what the defense counsel role in treatment court is also, so they understand that. And when they're talking to their clients and informing them about it, they know about this stuff. So I, I think it's good for everyone to know both both roles, but I just wanted to clarify for everyone what this training was geared towards. Thank you. So rule point one seven, conflicts of interest. Y you know, the best course of action uh, I can tell you is that you probably just should not have co-defendants on the same treatment court. That's just setting yourself up for a problem. It's setting the court up for a problem. It's setting the co-defendants up for a problem. And I don't know that we've ever had co-defendants on our treatment courts here in Billings. That I mean, I can't recall having two co-defendants on the same court. Um, we are blessed, though, with the fact that we have multiple treatment courts in Billings, so we can refer somebody to another court if they um, are a co-defendant from somebody who's in there. But the co-defendant situation really applies all the time in family recovery court, and I know there was a question about that that was submitted, and I'll get to that here in a little bit. Um, I think that what you have to remember is that those two parents typically are sitting in the role of co-defendants, even though it's not a criminal court when it's a family recovery court. And the reason why I say that is because the example that's given as a critical issue is when a person doesn't become a co-defendant, but when they become a witness against someone else who's in the program. Now, obviously, you're not going to be able to represent two people when they're witnesses against each other. That will be a time when you will have to call the Office of the Public Defender and say, this needs to be conflicted, conflicted out or it needs to be contracted out because we've got two people. One person saw someone drive into the uh, treatment center and they're not supposed to be driving and they reported it to someone at the treatment center. When that allegation comes, I want to remind you that's not necessarily an automatic conflict. And the reason why I say that is because in the treatment courts, we're dealing with a little bit different setting. So if you've got a case where uh, John Doe sees Jane Doe drive to the treatment center and Jane Doe does not have a driver's license. In fact, she's suspended. And John Doe reports that. Treatment also sees it occur, and treatment asks Jane Doe about it, and Jane Doe says, yeah, I drove here. Why? Uh, then you've got multiple witnesses to the violation. So before you start asking for lots of different attorneys to be involved in a situation, take a look at that and look at it on the team and say, you know, is this something if John Doe, or excuse me, if Jane Doe is unwilling to admit to her conduct and move forward with her progress in the treatment court, is this a case where you as a prosecutor are needing to call John Doe as a witness? That is one way to handle that conflict before it gets uh, to a point where you need multiple attorneys getting involved. However, if you think multiple attorneys need to get involved, again, this is an educated decision that you're making. So make that decision in favor of the client. Always make that decision in favor of Jane Doe and John Doe so that they have representation. So we have some statutes here in Montana, as we all know. And I like to say sometimes that you can find statutes in every park 
that you go to in any city in Montana. When you look at 1104 subsection two, subject to the consent of the prosecutor, that's getting us into the veto authority. And that's a subject that we'll talk about later in my presentation. That was a pre-submitted question. So I'm gonna move on from there. And subsection five uh, may impose reasonable sanctions. Again, what's important about the imposement or imposing of reasonable sanctions under the statute is there's a list it's included, but not limited to certain sanctions that can be imposed. And mainly what you need to know under your competency is knowing these statutes and knowing the opportunity, or excuse me, knowing the options that are available in terms of sanctions for your clients and making sure that those sanctions are not arbitrarily or capriciously bestowed upon the participants in the treatment court. Again, there's no right or expectation of a right to participate in a drug treatment court. But that does not mean that there isn't a place for a defense attorney somewhere in Montana to make headway with this. Uh, if their court's not applying an equitable or does not have an equitable policy or certain things that are qualifiers for someone to come into a treatment court. So remember that when you're in the treatment court staffing that you need to make sure that everyone who's applying to your treatment court is given a fair shake. And one of the ways that you can do that is to make sure that they're screened, even and going back to the prosecution veto, even if there's a veto, or even if the prosecution says, there's no way this person's coming into my court, say, well, respectfully, you're a part of the team and there's all these other people who are on the team and the judge is the one who should be making the final decision here. And so let's see what the team thinks and let's get this person screened. What I find is prosecutors typically are adverse to someone who's high risk, meaning they're very criminogenic. They're, they keep committing crimes and the prosecutor's tired of them, just tired of seeing their face. Well, I say, if you're tired of seeing their face, get them in a treatment court. And the reason why I say that is because treatment courts are designed to take people who are high risk and high need. High risk, they're criminogenic. High need, they've got severe substance use disorder. In Idaho, due process reigns. This is a, a case that's right next door to us. And this case is important because it's dealing with, in essence, the same statute that we have. And it's talking about that prosecutorial veto. That prosecutorial veto, um, when it's post, it is clear that in jurisdictions in the United States, if that veto is post judgment, meaning after that defendant has been sentenced to the treatment court, that veto is unconstitutional. There is question as to whether or not in Montana and in several other states, there's questions as to whether or not that veto can be used in the treatment court team when someone's an applicant. And so the ethical dilemma that you have as a defense attorney in the team is you need to know what the screening procedures are and the qualifiers. And I know I just touched on this. You need to know what those are and you need to make sure that everyone who's applied gets screened. If there's no funding, that's a different issue. And if there's funding to screen people, get them screened. Don't allow the prosecutor to just veto their entry. Here's another pitfall that we have in Montana that you might not necessarily think about when you're on a treatment court team. But a lot of treatment courts require that you go to their provider or they have a provider who signed an MOU with them and, and they're the only ones that they use. Well, what if somebody gets an evaluation from another provider? This comes up a lot when you're dealing with clients who are coming into the program or if you're a contract attorney, the question of whether or not you should get your client evaluated to see if a treatment court's appropriate. I strongly encourage you to talk with the treatment court 
itself if you're a contract attorney representing someone before they get in the court or if you're an OPD attorney in the same role. And if you're inside the treatment court team, you need to make sure that you have enough knowledge about levels of care to understand and challenge a treatment provider, again, in a non-adversarial way, but challenge them to explain why a particular person is at the level of treatment if they've had a chemical dependency evaluation, excuse me, a substance use evaluation. I'm not sure of the term today. But if they have that evaluation done and it says a different level of care than what your treatment court is stating that they need, that is something that you need to make sure that in the confines of the team that you understand why those levels are different. So I think we can turn to some of these questions now. Um, the, these questions are not submitted in the order, but this is pre-submitted question one that I wanna deal with. How can the prosecutor veto my client's participation? Well, one way is the prosecutor in your jurisdiction can just recommend incarceration. And that's in essence, a de facto veto if the court applies incarceration at the sentencing. That's something that you really can't do anything about other than there's no reason why as a contractor OPD attorney, you can't go into court and say, you know, my client wants to go to a treatment court. We've explored that option. And I'm asking you to order him or her to go into that treatment court as a part of their sentence because they've, they've chosen, they want to go into treatment court. That's one way to get around that. And then you're throwing it into the hands of the judge, especially if you're in a jurisdiction where your judge and your jurisdiction is also your treatment court judge. The prosecution can recommend that there's no entry until the case is resolved. You have to be careful about that though. There's no reason why somebody cannot come into the court post trial. And I hear from prosecutors a lot, especially the prosecutors in this jurisdiction, that they want the defendant to have changed his or her plea. They want them to be accountable. They want them to accept. They want them to get that done. In other words, they want to make sure there's not a trial on the horizon. Well, this is a difficult balance. When you're dealing with funding and screening people, and you're going to screen all these people who are set to go to trial, if they go to trial or if they choose not to come into the program, I could go on and on about this. What's important to remind your prosecutor on the team and what's important for you to remember for your diligent and competent, effective representation of your potential clients is that if somebody's going to come into the court or they want to come into the court, that they're told that they have to have their case resolved. Go to trial. If you're acquitted, you walk. If you're convicted, then apply to the treatment court. And if you have a judge or if you have a prosecutor who says if they go to trial, then I don't know why we would accept them. They're not being accountable. You have to just be respectful of that and know that that's not what is required. There's no statute. There's nothing that says that someone has to change their plea to guilty to come into treatment court. There is clearly adjudication, either through a probation revocation hearing. Uh, somebody can be sent there if they're on conditional discharge or as a part of a parole restriction. Somebody can come into your treatment court after trial. But again, if you have more questions about this, feel free to reach out to me. But just remember, it. it's not a requirement that they plead guilty. It's a requirement that the case be resolved. Remember, we talked about this a little bit earlier. Treatment court team should screen applicants based upon their qualifiers and their funding, not based upon a prosecution veto authority. I say, remember, it's not the prosecutor's court. It is a treatment court. And even if it is the prosecutor's court, they both have court in the title. It is the judge's decision. The judge should have the final decision as to whether or not someone comes into that judge's treatment court. The last thing we'll talk about on the veto is the veto is held by who? Who holds the veto by statute? Well, the prosecution holds the veto by statute. The judge 
if you read it, it says consent. So the judge holds a veto because remember the veto doesn't say veto, it's the consent of one and the defense. I don't know if this troubles anybody, but it troubles me that the veto is held by the defense. And the reason why that troubles me is because I don't know that if you're a defense attorney and you were to veto someone coming into the treatment court that you sit on, that that wouldn't be a violation of an ethical rule. And so in summary for this statute, I say the line spoken by Marcellus, I believe I'm saying that correctly, in, in Shakespeare's Hamlet, is there something wrong or there's something rotten in Denmark? The defense should not have a veto authority. And so the fact that they do in the statute tells me that there's something wrong with the statute. And what's wrong with the statute is that the prosecution and the defense should be struck in, or struck from the statute, only the judge, because the judge has the final authority as to who comes into the treatment court. Pre-submitted question number two, how do other courts handle sanctions when the penalty is jail or house arrest? Remember that when you're dealing with the sanction that is jail or house arrest, that's a loss of liberty. That's going to invoke their due process rights. The different things that I would say are um, if you're going to be terminated from the program, if they're going to impose work detail or sheriff's labor detail, which is in lieu of jail, if there's going to be jail or if there's going to be house arrest, any one of those things um, would invoke that right. What's important is that they have a right to a hearing. You need to know that. You need to know that the state has to prove by a preponderance the evidence at that hearing that the violation of the contract occurred and that the sanction should be applied. You have the right to have your own witnesses and evidence presented on behalf of your participant. You have the right to confront those witnesses and evidence against them. And I just say this is akin to how it's handled, akin to a um, probation violation hearing. But the best way as a defense counsel to address this question is in the team staffing, not in the courtroom. It's in the staffing and challenge the people on the team who are supposed to be working with you in a collaborative process to come up with a therapeutic response. What is jail going to do to somebody who's been to prison? Probably nothing. Best practices tell us that a jail uh, sanctioned for more than two days doesn't have better efficacy. So if you're looking at a court or a prosecutor who's saying, we need to get the point across, well, then use something to get the point across. I, I will tell you that many, many years ago, we had somebody who just kept driving and they were on a suspended license and they'd been to jail a few times. And Judge Nisley said, you know what? Um, and I will give credit to somebody on our team to get this to Judge Nisley. And Judge Nisley decided that she was going to impose, instead of jail, that they ride the bus system here in Billings for an entire day. They had to run every route. If they couldn't get it done in one day, they had to ride it the next day. But they had to ride and they had to come back and present to everybody in the treatment court how to ride the bus system because one of the things we find out is one we're fortunate enough in billings to have a bus system and two nobody likes to ride it especially our participants so that was a sanction that was different than jail or house arrest there was an opportunity to effectuate a change that participant did not drive again after having to ride the bus i can't tell you if he continued to ride the bus i can just tell you he didn't drive again Pre-submitted question number three, is it appropriate to have one defense counsel for two parents in a family recovery court? I think there's probably not a lot of people in family recovery courts. I think we only have three or four in Montana, but this is important. And if you're dealing with this question, this is also applicable to if you have two people in the court who um, ethically have the same issues as co-defendants. So I wouldn't just check out during this part if you're on a treatment court other than a family recovery court. Re rely upon rule 1.7, conflicts of interest and informed consent. Make sure that those two parents are saying they agree that they should have one attorney uh, if they have one attorney 
or if there's only one attorney in the family recovery court. The two parents must be aligned. Remember, these are some qualifiers. If they're both coming into the treatment court and they're living together and they're trying to get their kids back, this is something where they are aligned. If they're not living together, say they're divorced and they have no intention of being together and they have kids and they're both trying to get the kids back, you need to treat them as if they're co-defendants in terms of making an analysis for their participation in the court. Remember the conflict situation that we talked about earlier really arises when there's a liberty interest at stake. If you've got somebody who saw John Doe use methamphetamine and they said, I used methamphetamine, and they said, hey, I saw John using methamphetamine, and then treatment says, John, we're using methamphetamine. John says, yeah, I was using methamphetamine. Well, we're not going to have a hearing on that because there shouldn't be a sanction where there's a loss of liberty because of that use. And in a family recovery court, there should never be a loss of liberty unless somebody's in direct contempt of the judge in the courtroom, wherein the judge is confining them on contempt. There should not be a sanction in a family recovery court where someone goes to jail or does house arrest or sheriff's labor detail. There may be termination, and that termination is something wherein we have to go back to the rules. Am I a parent's or parent's attorney? I am a parent's attorney in a treatment court, in a family recovery court. First off, it's not practical to have 20 lawyers in a family recovery court. It, it's not practical to have that in any treatment court. That's why you need one defense attorney who's assigned to represent everybody who's in the program. And so if you've got 12 parents in your family recovery court and eight of them are couples, then you're representing all of them and you've got to make sure that those couples have signed something that they understand there's those potential conflicts and that they're waiving those in order to participate. That's the informed consent part. Informed consent is what? It's on the record or it's in writing, preferably it's in writing. Both parents are together maintaining their relationship. That's important. That's the sign that they're their goals are aligned. And again, you need to make sure their goals are aligned in order for them to give that consent. Parental, right terminations, parental rights termination hearings should not be held by the family recovery judge. In Billings, in the family recovery court here, I served as a guardian of litem on that court for a couple of years. And I can tell you that we never had a termination hearing in front of Judge Todd. And there's a very important reason for that. There's no way that Judge Todd could be unbiased in presiding over a termination hearing for someone who had been in his court for two years, someone who he had uh, sat through graduation with, someone who he's talked with in the courtroom, someone who he's helped out individually their kids uh, when they've had teenagers and had the teenagers call into court and talk to the judge. You just need to remember that. If you have a dependent neglect case, you need to send that back to the original jurisdiction judge who sent it to your family recovery court, or if it is the original jurisdiction judge presiding over your family recovery court, that you send that to another judge. That's your competency that you need to know that that needs to happen elsewhere. Fred, can I ask, uh, someone asked a quick question on that last slide. Sure. I just ask you now. Um, <clears throat> they asked if, um, does maintaining relationship between the parents, does that mean cohabitation or co-parenting? I would say that means co-parenting. Um, okay. I don't think that the, anybody should be re required to be living together. Um, if they're co-parenting, you know, if they're co-parenting and they're not living together, that's really going to lessen the potential conflicts because, again, remember, there's a, there should be a guardian ad litem or an, attor a, an attorney guardian ad litem or an attorney for the youth who's protecting the child's interests in that family recovery court. And so, you know, if those two parents are co-parenting and they're co-parenting effectively, 
one of the things that they can learn in the family recovery court is how to co-parent even better. So I would say that that line is drawn at co-parenting. Um, if they're divorced and they're not co-parenting well together, I would treat them as co-defendants. I does that answer the question for the participant? Mm -hmm. That was Mark Mackin. I don't know. <laughs> so Mark, when we get to the end here, if we have some time, I know when I look at the clock, we're kind of running out of time. And so I'll wrap up here and then we can go to just some questions and answers. Um, so Mark, if you have a, a follow up to that, please ask that when we get there. So in summary, did I mention I don't like lists? Let's follow the rules. So follow the rules of professional responsibility. I'll refer, always refer back to those. Uh, when in doubt, err on the side of your client. And when I say err on the side of your client, you should say to yourself in your mind right now, well, wait a minute, what if I have two clients and they're arguing with each other? Well, then that's a conflict. Well, what if I, what if I know something in staffing and, and I'm in a conflict situation because of what I know in staffing? Well, then get them an attorney outside of the uh, treatment court team what if I, what if I, it doesn't matter the what if, what matters is that you look at the rules and apply them. And if you have any questions, you feel free to reach out to me. I'll make sure you have my contact information. Respect the statutes. I say that you've got to respect the statutes. And you also have to remember that competency isn't just knowing our drug court statutes. Competency is knowing how they interplay with the rules of professional responsibility and knowing what to do in certain situations and knowing when to raise that objection to the prosecution veto or also knowing how to undermine that prosecution veto with your team. You know, if you need to have that legal battle, and I believe that at some point that will happen, we've not needed to have that here in Billings, but we've been dealing with it for years. Uh, certainly since 2014. So if you follow the rules and you respect the statutes, you won't end up here. <laughs> oh. Here's my contact information. And um, I believe that we have about eight minutes for questions. Uh, but I'll leave that to Kelly because I know that I was originally scheduled for 11 to noon for an hour. Um, no, you were, you were scheduled um, 1045 to 1145. Oh, great. Well, then yeah. it worked out well. Yeah. Um, so I'll just start here and then people can ask more questions. Um, well, and Roberta, I don't know if your question was answered, but she asked, OPD's position is, as noted earlier, to represent the client to a certain outcome. The treatment court is an outcome that ends our representation. Many of OPD attorneys have a caseload of 150 to 200 plus clients, obviating the use of one's time for such things as you outline here. What then? I, I think I think all treatment courts in Montana now have an either an OPD FTE that's the defense attorney in the treatment court, or there's a contract defense counsel for that treatment court. So there should be a defense counsel representing everyone in every treatment court in Montana. If that's not the case somewhere, someone could let us know. I think um, this is Roberta, and I, I think that's generally true. I am, I'm now a contractor, but I worked in-house and had, you know, 210 open files at any given moment. So even the ones who are dedicated to the drug treatment court, that isn't the only thing they do. And as you know, we ask way too much of the public defenders um, there's really no way you can get it all done. So what kind of things, shortcuts, whatever, you know, recommendations that we can make to help this task may be a little more manageable for people and not get in trouble, you know, with an ethics violation. So 
I know that oh, uh, a few years ago, um, I think it was pre-COVID, um, but I believe that they had a little meeting. Um, well, I shouldn't say I believe. I know there was a meeting with uh, OPD management and the Montana Supreme Court. And I believe Jeff Kushner, if he's on, could chime in on this. But there was a meeting about um, whether or not the courts, treatment court should be staffed with either a contract attorney or a public defender who is dedicated to that treatment court. And that an agreement was reached to do that. I know that the statute says that you can't represent people post adjudication, but the statute also in the treatment courts allows for that representation. And so there was an agreement or an MOU reached between the public defender's office, state office of the public defender, excuse me, and the Supreme Court with respect to providing counsel for people who are in treatment courts. I, you know, there shouldn't be a situation. Well, I, there's no way for me to address this. Nobody should have to represent 200 people. Nobody should have to represent 500 people. Nobody should have to have all these roles where basically they're committing ethical violations every day. It's the system that we live in. And all you can do is the best that you can do in the situation, which is why I say that there may not be a clear answer to a question, but there is a clear educated position that you can take as a defense attorney that when you're tasked by the Office of Disciplinary Counsel or you're tasked uh, by a judge that you can say, Your Honor, I can only do so much. I looked at the rule. This is what I decided to do. And, you know, I don't work for the State Office of the Public Defender. I am the contract attorney who staffs the Steer Court and the Camel Court. So you could always email me. I could respond to you. The state of Montana gave me the Bullisman Award, which was the professionalism award for the state of Montana. So you could always reach out to me and I could send you an email. And then if I'm wrong, you could say, hey, I talked to Fred. So he's the one who's got to go in front of the ODC. Yeah, I, th I think it is kind of a management issue if it gets to the point where someone's not able to do all this that they need to do in treatment court. They need to talk to their manager and that's where it goes. Just um, to clarify, um, this is Jeff Kushner. There was an agreement reached, Brett is correct. And basically what the agreement was, was that the <clears throat> public defender's office would continue to have representation in drug courts. But at the same time, any time that we applied for a federal grant, and in order to start a drug court in Montana, you have to get a federal grant to start it, what's called an implementation grant, that we would agree to put in uh, enough time for a public defender in the grant to be paid for out of the grant. And those grants generally run four years. So that's, that's basically what the agreement said. Thank you, and it, It's great, I'm sorry, it's great that they're ponying up some money, but that doesn't take away the fact that the client caseload is overwhelming and be to be able to do the sorts of things that you're talking about here today and each of the presentations, I mean, it they don't really meet each other. Having money and having people isn't the same thing. No. Kelly, what do we have for other questions? Yeah, okay, here's one. I was told by a prosecutor that a client can participate in treatment court before pleading guilty in district court. I view this as an ethical problem, especially in a possession case, since they are essentially admitting the crime by participating. Should the case be resolved before entering these, case, these courts? So yes, I think the case should be resolved before entering the court. You know, that's, that's one thing. Um, however, we have cases, you know, in Billings where people have come into our court uh, and they haven't changed their plea, but their change of plea is coming up. Okay. Um, but a lot of times, though, that's more of an issue as whether the client's going to go to trial more so than whether or not the client should be coming into the treatment court. If it's a drug charge, for the most part, we all know that drug charges are resolved either through a motion to suppress or the drugs were on the person. I, I mean, or they were in their 
possession. And so those are very tough cases to get around and getting someone into treatment services earlier has better efficacy. So in answer to the ethical question, it's a client choice. The client needs to make that choice and you need to advise the client accordingly. And if your advice to the client is, I don't think you should go into a treatment court until you have resolved your case. I can tell you that most of your treatment courts, if not all your treatment courts, should be saying the same thing. We don't want you in here until you've resolved your case. So I know that in the past, we have had people who have come into our courts here in Billings prior to case resolution. But case resolution doesn't also mean a change of plea. It can mean a deferred prosecution agreement. Um, it can mean the change of plea. It can mean uh, after trial, post adjudication after trial. So I would just say, you know what? Court, treatment courts are voluntary. That's a client decision. Advise them and let them make that decision. Okay. Thank you. Um, another question, how can we obtain copies of contracts if the local treatment courts refuse to cooperate with the defense attorneys who refer the client to the court? I see that Jeff Kushner is on. And so before he unmutes, I'm going to answer that because I want to supplant what he's going to say or what I think he will say. Um, you know, I, I know that Jeff's working on a statewide contract and other forms for everyone in the state as a part of something that he's doing. Um, I can tell you that the contracts should not be substantially different from one court to another court. They all have certain things that need to be required. If you want to see a treatment court contract, you've got my email information. When we're done with the presentation, I'll send the uh, presentation that I did to Kelly and she can disseminate it further. So uh, just know that if you want a copy of a treatment court contract that, in my opinion, should ha has everything in it that needs to be in it, you're welcome to have a copy of our veterans treatment court contract or our felony DUI uh, treatment court contract. As far as getting it from uh, your local team or local prosecutor or anything else like that, if you're first off, if you're the defense attorney on the team, you've already got it. If you're a contract attorney and you need it, there really is no reason why defense counsel or the prosecution on the team should not provide you a copy. And the answer to that is defense counsel on the team is the one who should go through that copy of the contract with the participant when they come in. So even if you provide that contract to someone, you know, I, I can I'll pick on Brad Finn for anybody who knows Brad Finn, but Brad Finn goes after things. He gets it done. He wants a copy of the contract. He reviews it with the con with the client. Client signs it, initials all the paragraphs, sends it over, and he thinks their client's in. Nope, they still got to meet with me. They still got to go through the contract with me. That is a qualifier for whether or not they're going to be admitted into the treatment court. Jeff, how are we coming on that potential statewide contract? Well, uh, Fred, I don't know that we're doing a statewide contract. We have several contracts, MOUs, other forms on our website that people can look at. I find it hard to believe that there is a drug court in Montana who when somebody requests a copy of the contract that they won't get it. Uh, if that's the case, I'd like to know about it. And I'd like to know why, because I, I like Fred, I don't see any reason why somebody should not be able to see a public document, uh, which is a contract for a drug court. Uh, we are developing some teleservices forms, Fred, that you helped us with. And I'll talk about those a little later, uh, but uh, we're not uh, developing a standard uh, required contract for Montana drug courts. I'm going to go, we just have a couple minutes left. I want to get to this last question. And then I see Eleanor has her hand raised. We can come back to that. Um, Fred, the last question I see is, wouldn't participating prior to convictions slash sentencing assist in a more favorable resolution? Well, it should. And I can tell you that, you know, in Billings, we have eight district court judges and so your likelihood of being in front of um, the judge who's the treatment court judge that you're going to go to is, you know, it's all percentages. So um, entering into that treatment court prior to case resolution certainly is going to help 
Our clients do better at case resolution. I've had times, multiple times over the years, where the recommendation was for Department of Corrections, but they got into a treatment court program and they were doing well, and that was the report to the court. And the particular judge on the case said, no, I'm going to let them continue on with what they're doing. So that's important. Also, too, it's important to get people into uh, the recovery process sooner, not later. So if someone's thinking about that, if they're thinking about they want to better their lives, this is a great opportunity for them in the criminal justice system to do that. Um, lastly, I'll leave you with sometimes prosecutors don't want those people that annoy them uh, having any kind of benefit or rehabilitation. And yet they are unwilling to exercise that uh, potentially unconstitutional veto. And that's an argument you're going to have in front of a judge. So if you can have a team screen and if they accept someone, knowing that that person has already resolved their case by way of change of plea and they're pending sentencing, but there's going to be an argument at sentencing as to whether or not that person should come into the court, their satisfactory compliance in the court for a couple of months, it, it really speaks loudly to the sentencing judge. So I strongly encourage that you do that. And if they're not accepted, don't forget your competency with respect to representing someone. If they aren't accepted into the treatment court program, the treatment court statutes allow you to get credit for time served for the time that you're in a treatment court program. So if you're in that program for three months before sentencing and the judge just doesn't let you go, remember to ask for that credit. Thank you, Fred. Eleanor, did you want to, uh, I know you posted the Supreme Court treatment court forms in the chat. Is yep, there something? I was just, just going to ask if there was time, if Fred would take a look at those and see how they compare to the most current ones, because there was a comment asking whether or not those were the most recent versions. So I thought someone who practiced in the treatment courts and billings could potentially click on one of the links and let people know. Uh, but Generally, in my experience, they don't change too radically from year to year, at least here for the treatment court programs. And when I was still a prosecutor in uh, Billings, Montana, I don't think they got changed the entire time that Judge Todd was overseeing the treatment court or Judge Gustafson, now Justice Gustafson, but I don't know whether or not the new judge is taking over for them to have modified the contracts or not. So our treatment court contracts for um steer court and camo court i think the last re revision was 21 which would have been our fourth revision since we started those courts and the revisions have always come from the judge myself and then uh, our former prosecutors now retired vicky calendar we work collaboratively along with uh, probation to make sure that um first off the statutes haven't changed at all so that's one thing uh, but to make sure that our contracts are complying with best practices and that we don't have something in there that is um you know not a part of what we do anymore you know um if you go back 13 years 15 years and even 20 years you had jail-based treatment programs so you had treatment courts that would provide treatment to somebody in the jail that's clearly not appropriate um so you you're going to have a revision for that but as we come forward um i don't know how to this is my first Zoom presentation, so I don't know how to look at those, but if someone wants to email them to me, I'd gladly look at them and comment. Um, Eleanor, so if you want to email them to me, I'd gladly look at them and comment, or I'll send you our contracts, which I will say our contracts are as up-to-date as they need to be. There's always room for improvement. For example, one of our paragraphs doesn't have a signature line in front of the paragraph, and each client who I review the contract with, I tell them the same thing please review the paragraph, read it. If you understand it and you don't have any questions about it, initial it. If you have any questions about it or there's something that's concerning to you, leave it blank and move on. And then I confirm that with them before they sign the contract. That's how I assure that they have, they have informed consent when they enter our program. Great, Fred. Thank you so much. And um, again, I will have Fred's um, PowerPoint posted at some point. So um, hopefully soon. If there's no more questions. 
if there's no more questions, I think we can be done. We'll have our lunch break and we'll start up again at 1245. Kelly, I'll email that to you right now. Okay, thank you. Yep. Okay. Thank you, everyone. Thank you, everyone.